uh, more on capacity building activities and uh, engagement efforts by uh, many organizations who are uh, acting globally and uh, also regionally. Uh, second part of the agenda will look more broadly uh, at uh, several initiatives uh, that are addressing uh, the region and some of them actually are actually uh, at the, working at the national and regional level. So uh, without further ado, I invite uh, Christine uh, to take us forward, please. Thank you, Hashem, and if I can invite panelists uh, to come uh, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, panelists for the first segment. And uh, do we have working microphones uh, at the table, or? Yes, no, no special seating. Please have a seat. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Hashem, for this introduction. And uh, it's a real pleasure actually to be here and uh, to discuss. I think um, I'm happy, uh, explicitly happy to see uh, discussions uh, uh, about and from the MENA region, something that we ha might have been missing for a couple of IGFs, but I think a strong presence, I see a strong presence in this IGF, and um, I'm really happy about that. Partially, uh, maybe, and I should give due thanks at, right at the start to the German government who have uh, uh, enable the participation um, from very different uh, um, uh, various regions, um, uh, and so thank you for that. So um, um, the first panel is on uh, regional engagement and capacity development efforts, and um, I, I, I hope that um, together with uh, the distinguished panel, which I'll be um, right now introducing, um, I hope we can actually uh, uh, add uh, value to existing efforts that uh, are already happening in the region, specifically on boosting engagement uh, uh, in internet governance from uh, our region, uh, not only uh, on a global level, but also uh, more uh, nationally and, uh, and regionally. And, um, and um, the, 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 se the first segment is supposed to actually look at existing efforts in capacity building, uh, and closer so that we can all be aware of what is happening. Some of us uh, uh, maybe need to have more information on uh, different efforts, but also uh, I hope we can together identify common challenges uh, uh, that we all face when we try to boost engagement, each in his different capacity, and how can we actually work together and develop uh, uh, solutions to overcome in a more um, uh, coherent and build up uh, uh, way uh, those uh, challenges. So um, I have a, a great panel with me. I thank them all for uh, accepting uh, to be part of uh, the event. And I will right at start uh, maybe introduce all so we can then have um, a discussion together that is vivid. And um, I, I'm, we plan to have a very interactive discussion with all of you. So I will stop at uh, various points through the uh, through the coming um, 75 minutes to hear from more from uh, participants uh, on their input as well. So uh, let me just um, um, go of, uh, according to my <laughs> uh, setup. I have uh, Shafi uh, Shaya from uh, uh, RIPE NCC. Uh, Shafi is Regional Communication Manager for uh, for uh, Middle East region at RIPE NCC, and he actively works with uh, uh, RIPE members and uh, the other and the, the larger stakeholders uh, uh, range uh, on um, um, different activities and topics related to internet governance and capacity building, uh, both nationally and also uh, regionally. I also have Manel Ismail. Manel Ismail is Executive Director for International Technical Coordination at the National Telecom Regulatory Authority of Egypt. She's also um, uh, the elected chair of uh, the Government Advisory Committee uh, of ICANN. I have at the very um, uh, left Vladimir Radunovic. Uh, Vladimir is a director, uh, cybersecurity and e-diplomacy programs director um, at Diplo Foundation. Uh, Vladimir is also a lecturer in uh, cybersecurity policy, internet governance and e-diplomacy for uh, postgraduate and professional courses. He also serves as member of the advisory board uh, of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise uh, and an expert uh, with the Geneva Internet Platform. 
Um, um, also have Fahd, Fahd Bataina. Fahd uh, works for ICANN as part of the global stakeholder engagement team. He covers the Middle East uh, and he contributes uh, to regional and national IGFs, um, uh, schools on internet governance, and deeply involved in many uh, different capacity development uh, programs. Uh, I have uh, to my left uh, Susan Telsta. Uh, she is uh, uh, head of capacity and digital skills development division and acting head of ICT data and analytics division uh, at the Telecommunication Development Bureau BDT of the um, International Telecommunications Union ITU. Uh, uh, last but not least, I have Adel Suleiman. Uh, Adel is a senior policy officer, uh, African Union uh, Commission. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me maybe uh, start right away with our uh, first uh, question today or f first point that we want to discuss. And um, um, I will maybe start by Shafi. Um, um, right, you go first, Shafi. <laughs> so at, uh, the first point that I would like to tackle in this panel is um, how can we actually uh, work to increase meaningful stakeholder participation uh, from the region in internet governance um, and digital policy discussions. So um, there is so much going on in internet governance and it's broadening, not becoming less. Uh, and we see the impact on the region. Um, we see that where we've been active, we're not capable to follow. We need a lot maybe of uh, development. We need more people to be engaged. Uh, and so um, what are the different uh, programs that are there, how can we actually achieve that meaningful participation through the different programs? So if you want to take, uh, I think the mic uh, in front of you might be working. Shafi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, thanks for being with us. And thank you for NTRA and ISOC for organizing this uh, pre-event uh, with Drive NCC. Uh, I am optimistic in my life, so I will start with what we are doing, and at the end, I will share with you the challenges that we have in capacity development. It's well known that uh, a country's successful development depends on having sufficient capacity. In the context of, of internet, the financial resources and the technology are vital. However, Without skilled and trained people, we cannot promote for a sustainable internet development. As a regional uh, internet registry, uh, our main function is to allocate internet uh, number of resources to Europe, Middle East, and part of Central Asia, and to keep a comprehensive uh, record for these allocations. But at the same time, we uh, promises to have the business, the, the uh, development or the capacity building as a, pri as a prime contribution to our members and to our uh, community. How we do this? We have many uh, channels and paths uh, in doing this. So we have face-to-face -face and online courses. We have a training, we have seminars. We visit countries, we uh, have tailored uh, solutions for each country. Uh, we uh, deal with all stakeholders from uh, the community, a private business like ISPs, mobile operator, governments uh, with TRAs, uh, academic with universities, and uh, financial institutions with banks. So we covered the whole region in the last five years when I joined RIP NCC, and we did really a nice job, and the outcomes are really was fruitful. However, this comes with challenges. First challenge that we have, I can summarize it by three words, reach the unreachable. We have some regions and countries that we can't visit for different reasons. So to deal with this challenge, or we invite these countries to join us in another neighbor country or through online seminars. But with this, we have a limitation in doing what we call hands-on exercises. Second challenge that I can, that from, my, uh, from our experience we can share with you is that each country has its own issues related to internet. So we need to tailor 
solutions to these countries that fits their needs. Doing this, we need more resources that with our organization, we have limited resources to do to, to, uh, these uh, tailored solutions. And here comes the joint effort with ISOC or with ITUD, with ICANN, to uh, handle or deliver these uh, trainings, each in his expertise. The third one, which, is I, which I can see it from outside the box, is that when we have these experts and when we deliver this uh, training on the ground, these skilled peoples leave the country. So we need to have suitable incentive environment to keep these local people in the country itself. Or not, they can go out and have expat contracts and work for other uh, international organizations. So this is the main three issues that I can share with you. Of course, some details from each country. Uh, for example, sometimes we don't have the suitable training, trainees, participants. So instead of having one level of people who have back technical background, we have different level of technical people, and we need to, you know, to go slow with this. Uh, and then we have this uh, timetable, different uh, income, different output. So there are some related issues uh, that are related to certain countries. But on and all, we are uh, doing our best. We are delivering all what we can in our uh, ex uh, area of expertise. And we are, de we are dealing with all issues that we have. Sometimes we can do compromise. Sometimes, you know, as a neutral uh, center of expertise, we give them the best case studies. We give them the success stories. And they will choose and uh, you know select the the the, the, uh, the the scenario that fits the country itself. Oh, thank you, Shafi. Maybe very briefly before before you leave the mic as well, if you can, because RIPE NCC has this unique, um, um, I think um, I don't know if it's unique, but I mean uh, has this special setup of running the, of uh, supporting the MENOC, uh, which is uh, gathering network operators in the region, but also does with governments a lot of work because explicitly your membership base is diverse. Um, and so from your experience in terms of uh, capacity building, do you think that uh, getting uh, connections or bridges between the world of uh, actual operators and governments is something that we still need to work on when we tackle capacity building? Very briefly, yeah. if you can also address that. We know that uh, the culture in the Middle East region is totally different from the European uh, countries. In Europe, the private sector leads. In the Middle East country, if we don't have the green light from the government, we can't go anywhere, to be frank. But I can tell that the governments are really lead in some initiative and projects and really give us a lot of help and give the resources that we need. The question that, yes, due to certain divergence in points of view between governments and private sector, that they seek the same goal, by the way. The, when we meet with the governments and we meet with the, government, with the private sector, both of the players, they uh, have the same goal to develop the internet and to work for the good of the internet in their country. But both players, they have their own perception and they have their own paths to, to arrive to this uh, goal. So yes, we are trying to be facilitator, let's say, put the governments and the private on the same table to try to uh, find a common ground for both of them. And we succeed in this. Now I can, I can share with you that in the, in the Middle East country, in the Middle East region, we have four IPv6 enabled countries. We have Saudi, we have Emirates, we have Oman, and we have Lebanon. And these four countries, this collaboration between the different stakeholders make our effort and make the, 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 the result that we see now that we are in the right track, I say. We still have time, but we are on the right track. Thank you, Shafi. Thank you. Now, speaking about governments, maybe I can turn uh, to Manel uh, Ismail. So, uh, Manel, from the perspective of GAC, and you work very closely uh, with all governments uh, uh, in leading the GAC, how do you see uh, efforts for capacity building or for engagement in the region maybe different than uh, elsewhere? What is much needed more here than elsewhere? How does the engagement look uh, for the CAC in terms of governance? Um, thank you, Christine. 
Um, and uh, so the GAC has uh, 178 uh, member uh, governments and uh, 38 uh, intergovernmental organizations participating as observers. Uh, but yet, uh, from the 178 members, we are having very limited uh, participation, particularly from our region. Um, in terms of membership, uh, we're only missing four countries from the region, uh, but still, um, as I said, the, the active participation uh, and, and the real engagement uh, is, is uh, very limited. Um, so I, I'll try to divide the challenges, some of which I believe we are already addressing well, uh, but also uh, other uh, challenges we're missing. Um, so uh, first of all, in terms of um, the topics that are being discussed, they are quite complex. The working language is English, of course, um, so there may be a language barrier, uh, there may be complexity of issues, um, and of course this is um, in addition to um, the workload and, and other things. Um, the GAC has been conducting capacity building uh, workshops uh, for quite some time now as a joint initiative between the um, GAC underserved regions working group um, along with um, ICANN teams um, of uh, government engagement and global stakeholder engagement. Um, so far we had um, uh, 10 workshops uh, and we had uh, 290 participants uh, from the different regions, uh, speaking about our region, uh, we already had three uh, workshops, one in Abu Dhabi in United Arab Emirates, one in Marrakesh in Morocco, and, and one in Bahrain, um, a very recent one in uh, September, last September. Um, the objective of the capacity building workshops, uh, of course, is lowering barriers to participation and encouraging uh, active engagement of uh, GAC members, uh, but also to make sure their voices are being heard um, uh, during the discussions uh, in order to be taken into consideration. Uh, we build the workshops around the needs and requirements uh, of the different regions. As Shafi mentioned, uh, each and every uh, country, they, they have different requirements and, and different uh, uh, needs. Uh, but also we help bringing uh, participants up to speed on specific hot topics uh, that are being discussed uh, uh, within uh, the GAC and ICANN at large. Uh, we've also tried to put other measures in place uh, to address um, other challenges. So we have um, real-time interpretation during the meetings in six UN languages uh, plus Portuguese. Uh, we have uh, real-time uh, captioning and transcription. Uh, we have translation of some documents and some parts of some documents. And this one is a bit challenging because we're not getting the usage that would justify the cost of, of, uh, of translating everything in all languages. So this is, uh, we're still struggling with this. Um, I can provide travel support to 35 GAC members and five observers. Um, um, and in addition to the capacity building workshops, we also hold a first timer session um, at the beginning of each meeting, face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Uh, we hold webinars before the meetings and read out sessions as well, and I'm sure Fahd will also uh, speak about this after uh, the meetings. Um, and uh, we also, um, we've been holding a high level governmental meeting uh, every other year, uh, because the feedback we got from GAC members was that we failed to convince our uh, our managers about the importance uh, of uh, attending uh, GAC uh, meetings. So we try to do this to bring to the attention of um, high level governmental officials uh, the work of ICANN and the GAC so that they can spare their delegates uh, the authority to speak during the meetings, the resources to, to attend the meetings, but also to follow up the discussions uh, online and, and, uh, and the time to, to participate as well. Um, 
Uh, there is also an ongoing dialogue within ICANN on the evolution of the multi-stakeholder model of ICANN and how uh, this could facilitate the participation um, of those who are not uh, uh, deeply engaged yet. So all these are some uh, of the efforts that are uh, currently in place uh, to address uh, the, the weak uh, participation. Um, I have to say that those may have addressed a few of the challenges, but we are still facing, for example, uh, challenges regarding continu continuity of participation. So we have a very high turnover. We, we do the capacity building workshops, we do the, the orientation and everything, but then the representative changes. And unfortunately, there is not a smooth handover between uh, uh, those who are participating, so this is uh, still a challenge. Um, another challenge is the, the workload and pr the prioritization itself, and, and we've got also feedback from members uh, that they fail to link the work um, or the discussion we're having uh, with the national agendas. So this is also something we are still trying uh, to work on and, and to address. So um, I think I may stop here, uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I have a few suggestions, but I'm not sure whether this is the right point in time or. I, I think we can come back on them, but I wanted maybe to trigger one point, uh, maybe out of your experience, because I know that there was, um, a phase when there was there was heavy engagement from from the region on specific topics within the ICANN GAC, like that when there were discussions about specific domains. So um, my question here is, how can we draw from that experience? And maybe if you'd like to reflect now, or maybe also later, on how can the topics, when they're relevant, really, or when they are mutual interest, uh, you know, trigger engagement in a more snowball effect between countries of the region? So. So uh, you're right, Christine, and, and at some point in time, we got uh, good participation from uh, countries within the region uh, when there was uh, really a, a hot topic that concerns the region. Um, and this had to do with a few uh, new GTLD strings uh, like uh, .islam, .halal, uh, .gcc, and, and a few others. Uh, problem is, if you don't follow up the discussions and participate, you will get to miss the whole thing. So despite the fact that maybe not every single thing is equally of interest to everyone, but still it's important to follow uh, what's being discussed and, and at least keep an eye on anything that may be of interest or um, alerts the region. Um, another very good example also was the introduction of IDNs. Uh, this was also a, a very successful exercise in collaboration from the region. So, and, and this was one of my, the suggestions actually, is uh, regional coordination in preparation for the meetings, but also follow up after the meetings because this was vital in, in the introduction of uh, IDNs and uh, we all were speaking one voice. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Manel. So um, uh, before maybe I turn to one round of uh, floor, I will give the floor to Vlada. So Vlada, you've heard a bit uh, on efforts that are, uh, um, that are directed to the region and speaking about how to get the region together uh, to further engagement and or to boost engagement. I think we might want to hear from you on new trends, on innovative ways, on you know thinking out of the box in terms of capacity, capacity building and engagement, maybe reaching out to new disciplines. I know uh, you had many ideas, to, so if you can give us uh, an idea. And also, what are the challenges that you see you've worked with the region? What are the challenges that you see from your perspective as maybe an outsider organization and then how can we tackle that Please. thanks Christine and, and first of all thank you for inviting me to join this I always feel so pleasant being in, in the company of all, all the people I know <clears throat> uh, some folks in Diplo they prepared a photoshopped version of me as Lawrence of Arabia and the Comivlada of Arabia because they, they know that exactly they know that I like being in the region 
uh, but you, you already mapped quite some quite some things which are important. One is that uh, there is no there is no single bullet. Uh, there, you need to adjust the the approach to everyone. Then you have the new actors. You have the new topics. If we look at the internet governance ten years ago, even five years ago, uh, the topics were completely different. N not different, but they were not so in depth. We were talking about IG. Now we're not talking about IG. We're talking about security, cybersecurity, privacy, human rights, artificial intelligence, and then artificial intelligence and ethics and principles and human rights. It's really much in, in depth than it used to be five years ago. Uh, you have a lot of institutions which have no, a lot of people which know much more than we used to have. So the IG is changing, if we wish. The geopolitics is changing. Um, five years ago, uh, who was talking about uh, data protection? It was mainly the advocacy groups. It was mainly the the, the NGOs, not the states, not that much. In the last five years, we got the states talking about uh, data localization, uh, the GDPR came on, and so on. Talking about security. Uh, now we see the cybersecurity or national security be, being within the trade wars, even. Let's, geopolitics is changing. So there are a lot of things that are changing. And then the target group is also changing. Uh, we here, we are a big family at the IGF, and we know each other. But coming to diplomats, coming to parliamentarians, coming to people that actually bring decisions, it has always been a challenge. And it's not just in the Middle East uh, region. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, just look at the, <clears throat> I, I would begin to, to actually see the success of this year's campaign to bring the parliamentarians to the IGF. And there is funding, and there is a sort of a communication. I don't know what the results are. It would be good to hear if we know. But it's not easy to get the parliamentarians which actually want to come here. I don't know if there are any parliamentarians here. Uh, okay, I, I don't have to be cautious what I'm speaking, <laughs> even though it goes to transcript. No, but seriously, I mean, it's, it's not easy. <clears throat> so some of, the, uh, some of the lessons learned from, from, what is it now, almost 20 years of diplomacy work in capacity building in, in ICT and diplomacy, in a way. Um, one thing is certainly that the capacity development is, is, is not... Um, an event, it's not a training, it's not um, a course, it's a process, it really needs to be the process. And we usually forget about it. Uh, we usually do the training and we say, okay, that's it, people are, are there. Uh, you can do the training, um, which I, I think is very useful, like what ICANN does, what ISEC does, we do it as well, back to back to IGF, ICANN meetings and so on. But that means that you get the people that might, at best, understand what's, what they're going to listen to at the next, in the next two, three, four days. But they don't have time to actually build the, the opinion and, and get the courage to jump on and say, this is what I think about cybersecurity. This is what I think of that, about, I don't know, human rights or intellectual property rights. Uh, so it needs to be the process which actually our experience shows that what, what used to be uh, working in a way is that you start with, with a, let's say, we start with the online program which lasts for like 10, 10 weeks, which is highly intensive. And mid-level professionals get into the topic, into details. Then, uh, a couple of days ago, back-to-back -back with the event, we bring them together to firstly meet. Secondly, they already have a strong base, they understand. Then they have a chance to learn from the experts in vivo and exchange the opinions in you know, setting face-to-face. -face. Then they are in the process. So the sort of a, the immersion at the IGF, at the ICANN, and so on. And then they have the courage to raise a hand. And if Windsurf is speaking, someone will say, Mr. Surf, I have this opinion. Otherwise, they're going to be shy and sit down back and not doing anything. That's for the mid-level professionals. For the diplomats and the decision makers, it's, it's also different. They're in different shoes. Mid-level professionals might have the interest to learn about whatever the topic. Diplomats uh, or, or parliamentarians, they, they have different goals. Parliamentarians usually, well, face it, they want to win the next elections. You have to be in these shoes. Diplomats, like the missions of most of our countries, particularly Africa, Middle East, even Asia, in Geneva, in, in uh, New York, they're small. They have three, four people. They're covering everything from migrations to health to armament to whatever, NIG, digital. Well, who cares about digital? So you really have to be very cautious. How do you approach them to get them on table and, and be in their shoes? There is no, no silver bu bullet on that one either. Uh, what we try to, try to do is... Um, uh, Focus on not only on what, and I think that's the key message. We, when we talk about capacity, build, uh, capacity development, we usually talk about what should we tell someone. I dare say that it's even more than 50% is how, not what. How do you approach them? We usually don't think about it. And it needs to be innovative. That means people don't read anything anymore. If you do the briefing, pay, uh, briefing reading, it needs to be a half a page, a page. 
A briefing for parliamentarians now has um, maximum one page on cybersecurity. That's nothing, but that's as much as they can read. As much as you can, you do the illustration, you do the visuals, that's something that, that's appealing. You do the blended approach uh, where you combine uh, online in situ, you, you try to target them, particularly higher level ones, ta ta try to target them to link the training with what's happening. For instance, there is a discussion in WTO, World Trade Organization on, I don't know, e-commerce. You try to come up to them a couple of weeks or months before the WTO because you know they will be immersed into that and say, you need help on this. Oh, yes, we need. So that, try to link to, to, to what, what, what is actually their concern, right? Um, of course, try to put it on the level they can understand. Again, that's, that's how. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the regional integration, it's not easy. I think using, using uh, uh, and I think Adil will talk uh, later on about the PRIDA project, but actually using the regional approach to, to a more comprehensive capacity development process, not just a, a program, that's the key. Uh, and with a blended thing, and there is one more thing. We can train the mid-level people. We can train, we can raise the awareness among the high-level people. But if we don't link them vertically, if those on the top don't understand they have people on the, on the ground, and if those on the mid-level don't, don't know that the guys up know about them, we didn't do anything. We have silos, right? So we have to find, we have to do it comprehensively. I know it's a buzzword, it's not easy, uh, but, but it really needs to be about how even more than about what. And I'll stop there, but you can get back to it. Oh, thank you, Vlada. Very, very interesting about all the linkages that we have made. It looks to me like many dimensional linkages that, uh, that are needed out there. So maybe let me turn out uh, to you. And uh, if someone would like uh, to grab a mic, I don't know if we have mics. Do we have any mics in the room? Uh, if not, yeah. And uh, I kindly ask you to introduce yourself and be yes. uh, concise very so that we can ha big. hear from other Th people. Thank you, Christina, and thanks to your distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, uh, it is all about capacity building and uh, involvement. But really, since the last IGF... Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, my name is, uh, sorry, my name is Khalid Ibrahim from the Gold Center for Human Rights. Um, Last IGF, together with efforts from Hanan and Dr. Willis Saqaf, we managed to, uh, to have a meeting for MENA participants, and we agreed to uh, have consultation in preparation for this IGF. Unfortunately, none of that happened. And now, in this IGF, all our chronic problems are not addressed. Where is the consultation with civil society? So far, the IGF Arab, we don't know anything about the Arab IGF, whether it's council, dead, alive, nobody is telling us anything. Now, to this IGF, did we do any cooperation to address our chronic problems, the lack of uh, uh, network neutrality, uh, the lack of freedom of expression on the internet, and the fact that internet is, is, is all, all the time blocked in countries such as Lebanon and Iraq and other places just because people, uh, they want to communicate about peaceful protests. I mean, I believe strongly that we need to address the real problems, the fact that the IBS, all the time, the internet uh, service providers are owned by, on many occasions, by intelligence services. Who, when we are going to cooperate to support our people to have freedom of expression on the net, when we are going to provide internet for the poorer of our communities, when we are going to consult with civil society, just talk about these problems. These are very important. Civil society activists and their organizations are not enemies. We just want to have a peaceful change in our countries in which our citizens will have a rule and a future that is prosperous for everybody. Thank, Thank you, Christine. You. Thank you, Khaled. And I think, yeah, I think the part of uh, the panel here is actually to identify mechanisms whereby we can do linkages to talk, to have yeah. processes or uh, uh, venues where we can actually discuss all those points that are relevant. But also your points are very important to take back when we, uh, when we talk about capacity building so that we, we can go to civil society and then to governments and then to the different stakeholders, to the industry, and say here are the concerns that are coming from the other stakeholders group. Uh, um, if anyone else would like to chime in, I, oh, please. Thank you, Shan. Thank you, Christine. Uh, my name is Ayman al Sherbini. I'm uh, from the United Nations Economic Social Commission for Western Asia and the Arab IGF community. 
uh, I would like uh, to shed light uh, on another angle uh, re related to the participation and the word meaningful. So for some people, look at it as the, the availability or accessibility, which we have discussed, accessibility to knowledge, accessibility to participation, things like that. For some others, including ours, UM, for example, look at it from a totally different angle, which is the meaningful participations should uh, be linked to the impact of participation. So when there is an impact of participation, then for some constituencies, would uh, look at it as meaningful. So can we also have a round of discussion on how can we really, and this is a problem related to the uh, regional IGFs only, but the IGF model in general, and this is something I talked with Vlada before on, re related to that and with uh, Jovan and many others. How can we start new era of uh, uh, impact sizing, whatever the word is, the IGF dialogue or the INRI's dialogue into something that even we can measure and say, look, this was a connection. This was because of the, uh, that this happened, the global that this happened and so on, regarding policy change. Whatever the policy is, be it net neutrality or fake news or whatever. So please, can you shed light on that angle, uh, impact? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayman. I believe uh, the next segment will talk about policy development, and I think it will be very relevant uh, uh, and I invite Hanan, maybe uh, when she's motoring, to actually address how impactful, impactful policy development can be and how to measure that. And I think I look at it as a closed circle because at the end of the day, capacity development and engagement need actually to learn from the impact of policy development and you know uh, evolve. So I'll take one more intervention uh, from the floor and then turn back to the panel. Uh, okay, I'll take one and then we will have another round, so please. Can I go on? Yes, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Uduma. I'm from Nigeria, and um, I'm part of the Africa uh, Regional um, IGF, and um, both at the continental level and at the, at the sub-regional level, as the West Africa. And um, um, I think we have made a lot of progress from the day I came to the IG space. Uh, first, there was the issue of language barrier that um, hindered so many of the African countries. I don't know about the, the, um, the Middle East, I, I suppose is the same from participating. Participating partially, I mean, passively and uh, effectively participating. So um, uh, now the, language, the, 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 the business of uh, IG space had always been in, um, in uh, English. In uh, most of the countries, uh, we don't have um, the we do, we don't speak English, and English is not our first language. So that's one one big barrier that I have uh, also identified. Um, secondly, the question of having national IGFs, because that's the grassroots, and that's where it begins, and that's where awareness creation would be. So anything that can promote, anything we can do to promote the national IGFs being in place, then we can speak to ourselves in our local languages because in West Africa, we have the French speaking countries that have organizing their um, national IGFs. They are now participating effectively in IGF, even in ICANN. And again, translation and interpretation as in, you know, has increased in this uh, space, and so we'll see more of uh, our people coming in uh, or participating, not only pass passively, but effectively. So any mechanism we'll be looking at will be the one that will promote the national IGF processes in our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Very, very also um, inspiring to uh, listen uh, to uh, the different challenges also from the African region. I think there are so many synergies that uh, that can be drawn here. So um, uh, with that comment from Mary, maybe I can turn to Fahd. Um, ICANN has been uh, a supporter of national IGFs, regional IGFs, but also many other initiatives that I can say can be labeled as multi-stakeholder partnerships and initiatives. Uh, the question is, how do the challenges look? And I know there are many uh, 
that are unique for the vision here. Uh, so what is, from your perspective, this experience, and if you can shed also light on um, engaging maybe civil society, because this is one of the questions that came from the floor, I think uh, y there is a story to tell you. So Fed, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Christine, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure being here uh, with you. Uh, so at ICANN, uh, we've always been supportive of um, internet governance-related initiatives because the whole concept of internet governance revolves around uh, bottom-up, uh, multi-stakeholder, consensus-driven uh, mechanisms, uh, and actually that falls at the heart of uh, ICANN's policy development process. Of course, there are many misconceptions, uh, sorry, m m misassumptions around ICANN and what it does, and actually that has a spillover effect on uh, our role in internet governance. Uh, so for example, many people approach us thinking that we actually police the internet, um, in, in, in some better cases, they assume that we actually regulate the DNS industry and we have the authority or the kill switch uh, to put on and put off uh, domain names. And, and, and that's where, of course, they start discussing with us about um, our, uh, a, a much needed deeper role in internet governance. Of course, uh, just so that we are all uh, on the same page, ICANN has a very limited mandate of uh, working on the unique identifier system. And if we exclude the part on uh, uh, IP addresses, which is in the hands of uh, the RIRs, um, and the protocols, which is in the hand of the IETF, uh, that really leaves ICANN uh, with, with the domain name uh, system. Now, as I mentioned, we do, uh, uh, we do, we do support uh, the internet governance uh, discussions. We, we support the internet governance ecosystem. And of course, as a result, uh, we also support initiatives around uh, internet governance, whether the forums, uh, national, regional, and, uh, sorry, national, regional, and global, or even the schools on internet governance, again, at the same three levels. Um, of course, within, within the Middle East, for example, uh, there has been, we, we have had this uh, school on internet governance uh, for, the, for the MIAC region, which we call the MIAC region, which is the Middle East and adjoining countries. And actually, it was a request that was put in literally uh, when ICANN's engagement strategy was developed in the region uh, back in 2013. So they wanted a, a, an organization to kind of uh, kickstart this initiative. Um, an organization that would uh, be willing to inject um, sufficient funds uh, to actually have it. Uh, ICANN gladly took, uh, took up the, the, the step, uh, the, the, sorry, this role, and of course uh, from day one we worked very closely with our iStar partners in the Middle East, uh, whether it be it uh, the regional internet registries, uh, RIPE NCC of course uh, worth mentioning here, um, and of course the, the Internet Society. Um, of course, it's not, it makes no sense to, to lead such initiatives at a regional level because we are not the only player in the ecosystem. Uh, there are plenty of other players who are technical or non-technical um, who are actually a part of this ecosystem and actually in order to deliver uh, top class uh, uh, course, uh, uh, five day experience uh, under the, the hoodship of, of the School on Internet Governance, uh, we really need uh, everybody to be on board. Uh, speaking about uh, internet governance forums, of course we have in the region uh, the uh, Arab IGF and the most recent uh, North Africa IGF. Again, ICANN supports these initiatives. And of course, uh, just to mention, just to pause here for a while, when I, when I speak about support, it doesn't necessarily mean financial support. You also can include human resources, because in working on these initiatives, there's a lot of manpower that is put, a lot of hours that are um, consumed into actually um, having um, solid agendas and, and, and having solid speaking roles um, and of course uh, uh, kind of mobilizing the community and bringing relevant uh, people. Um, so yes, as I said in the region we have the Arab IGF, we have the North Africa IGF uh, which we've al always supported and found to be very good platforms to actually uh, discuss our work at ICANN and at the same time engage uh, with the wider community and probably niches of community where you would not probably engage uh, elsewhere, and I'd like to emphasize on civil society. Um, our dear friend actually mentioned about civil society, so yes, I mean, in some parts of, of, of our region, uh, Middle East, uh, sorry, in some parts of our, uh, the, the, of the Middle East, uh, the term civil society is, is, is misunderstood, um, maybe intentionally, maybe not, uh, but it's, um, in some countries it's really a, a taboo term, and, and so even, even civil, civil society activists, many of them tend to shy away from actually you know, showing themselves as, as a civil society uh, people. Um, 
Of course, over the course of the uh, past six or seven years since the start of the Arab IGF and then the School on Internet Governance, and then we started seeing more national IGFs, uh, national schools on internet governance, and of course the most recent uh, North Africa IGF. I think there is still a lot to work on. You find that uh, many of the attendees are actually um, have, have the very basic knowledge of understanding how the internet functions and what the internet function. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the way in which the internet functions. It's it's actually ironic. I, I engage a lot with academia and academic students, and one of the few questions uh, that I ask uh, on regular basis is. Who runs the internet? Do you really think that the internet is a spying device by uh, the FBI or the CIA? And actually, it just doesn't strike the mind of many people how, how really the, the internet functions. Yes, I mean, people can surveil the internet, people can monitor the internet, but it really depends more or less on policies that are put in place. And, and definitely, this whole notion of the CIA and the FBI thrown into the frame no, doesn't make uh, much sense. Um, of course, um, just to wrap up, I think there is a lot uh, that still needs to be done uh, within the MENA region. Uh, a lot of capacities need to be developed. I think trying to, try, trying to integrate our work into curriculum, not necessarily under the term uh, internet governance, but under any other term, is, is very vital and very important for our communities to actually understand how this technology works, uh, what's the benefits of, of, uh, of, of this technology and, of course, how best uh, to embrace it to actually push our digital economy agendas forward. Thank you, Fat. Um, speaking of um, efforts of collaboration, um, I think, I think we, we need to look at also ways of how to integrate efforts uh, in this region, how we can actually uh, we have different silos, it was mentioned. We have many efforts from different organizations. We've heard from so many. But how can we actually work collectively? I think this is one of the challenges uh, that, that we may have. And I, I'm, I know the, um, the ITUD uh, has recently um, uh, come uh, with new development, uh, capacity development programs. And just recently, many of us have participated to a, um, to a, to a program that has uh, been in Bahrain. And um, to me, uh, having been there in Bahrain, it was striking that uh, there was a lot of collaboration between different stakeholders that don't usually, or different parties that haven't classically been coming together. I don't know about other regions, but in this region, they haven't been coming together. The other striking fact was that we had um, a new community that is not classical to the IG that was present there. And that was an addition because we were reaching out to new communities. So Susan, maybe you can tell us a bit more about collaboration and that effort and how do you foresee from the experience of Bahrain how to build upon that and actually have more of that uh, coming? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, Thank you, uh, Hisham, uh, he's left, but thank you for the organizers for inviting um, me and inviting ITU to, to be part of uh, this uh, panel. Um, I wanted to say a few words. I'm here in my capacity as head of um, capacity and digital skills development in ITU, but I'm also acting head of uh, statistics and I worked in that field for many years in the ITU and I wanted to um, say something at the beginning that links those two topics in terms of um, the need to build capacities uh, more generally because, um, and I think it's, it's quite important to keep that in mind. Um, you may know that uh, just recently we released new data um, on internet usage in, in 2019. So we are now at the level of about 58% of global internet usage. So keeping in mind that we still have a big, um, a big portion of the population that is actually not even um, online. Uh, we also found that the gender um, internet user gap has grown uh, significantly over the past six years. And, uh, and that's another concern we also have to keep in mind. And that gap is uh, especially large in the least developed countries, in the poorer countries, but in this region is also quite large. So we also need to keep that in mind. And my point, I wanted to make that bridge to, to capacity development is that um, uh, we do have a, a very good net, network coverage overall right now because we are also tracking the um, 
the population that lives somewhere where they have access to a, a service, um, uh, a mobile service. So more than 95% of the population lives somewhere where they have access to a 3G um, service. So what I'm getting at is the one of the main reasons for why people are not using the internet is not necessarily because of the lack of access to the service, but if you ask them, a lot is around um, capacity and skills. That's one of the, the key barriers um, apart from affordability, content, we, we know all that, but the lack of uh, capacity and knowledge about internet and skills on use it uh, if, uh, to, for their benefits is one of the main reasons for why, that we have now to address in the future in order to get um, uh, more people online. So this is why it's so important to talk about capacity development and let me now come back to this particular issue of internet governance. So we were asked by our um, membership in, in our, our last World Telecommunication Development Conference in 2017 to specifically look into building capacities on internet governance uh, for our membership. Okay, so we do a lot of training on all sorts of topics, but they're usually very specific. Internet governance is not specific, and as you can see here at the forum, and we have seen the evolution of the Internet Governance Forum over the years, the topics that are being dealt with are, are very wide and very complex, and they reach into many, many different aspects because governance aspects are related to so many topics we are discussing related to internet. So when we then said, okay, what are we go how are we going to do this uh, and how, how, how can it be actually done in a meaningful way? So first we looked around what is actually already done and we engaged also with Diplo at that stage to do a stock taking and a mapping of who is doing what on capacity development in internet governance. And there are so many stakeholders out there, all, all of us being here, uh, there is the academic institutions as the tech community, there is the civil society, there are all the uh, international organizations. So um, everybody is involved to some extent in that field and where, where sh what should ITU be doing here? So we were, we were looking, we were taking stock, there were also recommendations made in, in this report that we commissioned. And um, we are trying to address specifically our uh, membership, which means our policy makers, our administrations, uh, regulatory authorities, because uh, uh, that's a very specific target group that we work with in ITU. And uh, we are trying to get them more involved into the debates on internet governance. But, uh, uh, and I would like to share with you um, three main points that we have, uh, how, we are, um, how we have approached it and what we found uh, um, at least for now useful, but we are, we are looking to developing this further. One is uh, the topic to, to, be, um, to be addressed in the capacity development uh, in this field. So we have started, uh, and also because we worked with Diplo at the beginning, to look at the basket approach that Diplo also has, which covers many different topics. And uh, we have used that as a basis also in our internet governance uh, capacity building workshops. So we look at uh, different uh, topics ranging from infrastructure to cybersecurity to data protection to digital um, economy to, of course, the domain names. Uh, we are looking at these different uh, topics because they all have governance uh, aspects and that needs to be clearly uh, communicated. However, at the same time, each region has a different uh, set of priorities. And in the last uh, workshop, uh, um, because we decided to embark on a series of regional workshops on this, and the last one, uh, which uh, Christine referred to in Bahrain, um, also then started out with asking people, so what do you think are the regional priorities here in your region? And then later on, when we, um, during the workshop, when we put people into the breakout groups, they also had to work on issue prioritization for the particular region. So while we need to look at uh, being comprehensive, we also need to look at what are the priorities in the particular um, uh, region. And then the second point is um, on the multi-stakeholder approach. So, okay, you will say, so what, what's new about that? <laughs> That's what we are all doing here. But in terms of capacity building from our point of view in ITU, it's, it has, it's a different approach than what we have done in our traditional training 
where usually we have uh, we hire experts who are um, e experts from academia or others who are who are knowledgeable on one certain subject and then they deliver the training. This is obviously not the case with internet governance because uh, every a different stakeholder group um, has a different role to play in the internet governance uh, process. So it became clear very early on we, we need and we want to work with other um, um, uh, partners on this so that we get the diverse uh, view and also the expertise from every uh, partner that is um, involved in, in the particular subject area. So this is why we have um, a partner, like in our last uh, workshop in, um, in Bahrain, we had Diplo, we had RIPE NCC, we had ISOC, we had ICANN. Um, we had, um, uh, who did I forget? <laughs> ISOC, I think I mentioned, yeah. So they were all there um, and, and others, everybody who is now also on this panel and also in the subsequent panel and it's, um, it's quite important because of the different, uh, of the different uh, subject matters that are being uh, dealt with. So that's another uh, different approach that we are taking in, in this particular uh, work on capacity building on internet governance. And then the third uh, element is how we are delivering the training. So we have, um, we have experimented to do it in a way where we have a mix of um, uh, of presentations to have some knowledge transfer, but then we have a lot of engagement of the participants through breakout groups, through role play, through simulation exercises, where they can actually uh, uh, try to do some real life um, uh, uh, practices in terms of uh, uh, discussing and uh, even negotiating in, in different groups, and also taking different perspectives. So the policy makers will have to take perhaps the defend the interests of the civil society so that forces them to look at things from a different perspective. And this is also something that, that actually participants like this most um, about, this, um, about this, this kind of delivery of training. So that's something that, uh, that could be also looked at more in the future. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Susan. Um, so maybe I can turn to Adel. Uh, Adel, um, now speaking about um, uh, <laughs> speaking about uh, different um, initiatives and about uh, you know collaboration, um, the African Union has the Preda initiative or the Preda project, and I know that there is a specific um, um, uh, vertical on internet governance, the capacity development, and um, since the North African region, part of the MENA region, is obviously um, uh, an area when we have many colleagues also from uh, the North African region and the North African IGF present, uh, is an area that also maybe needs a lot of uh, work in terms of engagement. I'd like to hear your experience uh, as African Union in that, uh, and also what you think, um, how, how can we actually connect dots between the different initiatives um, in light of the PREDA project? And maybe also, sorry, reach out beyond the region, because I know you have many collaboration with uh, Europe in that. Thank you, Christine. I, I think PRIDA with I, Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. So it's an I, it's not an E. Um, I like the question that were asked, by the way, in the beginning. And I think that this goes to the heart of the issue. Uh, in the African Union, we looked at uh, at why Africans are not participating in the global debate, actively participating, as you mentioned, and we try to answer this question. And in collaboration with European Union, we came up with this policy and regulation initiative for Digital Africa, which has uh, several tracks, but one of which is the IG track, Internet Governance track. And um, I think we need not focus on the mechanics, like having the IGF and so forth, but we have to look at the impact. We need to create value, not only to those who are attending the forum, but those who are not lucky enough to be in, in the forums, whether it's at the national level, regional level, or the uh, global level. So PRIDA, I think tomorrow at noon, we'll have a session. Um, we're gonna talk more about the PRIDA initiative. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, we are trying to address the question uh, of creating value and impact and having uh, active Africa participation in the global debate. So PRIDA has two streams, right? Particularly when it, we talk about IG. 
Number one, we wanted to make sure that we strengthen and enable processes at national, uh, sub-regional, and regional level. This is number one. Number two is to build capacity. Build capacity also national, regional, and continental level as well. So in terms of uh, uh, strengthening the processes, first of all, there are countries who don't have IG processes. We wanted to make sure that all 55 African countries will have processes in place, right? And there was a discussion about the policy development process. We need to make sure that these are enabled so that they can, of course, they're free to develop their own national policy on, on uh, internet uh, public uh, public internet uh, policy just make sure that we create the enabling environment for them they have the uh, uh, the structures the processes uh, actually we, in fact we develop a, a toolkit uh, under pre the project which is in which will enable countries and regions to be able to develop uh, their national uh, IGF or regional IGF and it's a very uh, detailed toolkit. It has all the questions that is being asked around IG and IGFs are answered in the toolkits and where we can find resources uh, and who, who are the stakeholders and how to get them engaged in the process and so forth. We are also helping the regions to make sure that they would they have regional IGF and regional schools. In fact, we did that for the Western African uh, region, ECOWAS. They did their uh, IGF and their uh, schools back in July. We helped the East, East Africa community. Uh, we are, next, uh, next month we'll also do uh, for the Central Africa. And in fact, we are doing also something for, NASA, for North Africa, not uh, the uh, regional IGF, but the school on IGF. We are contemplating on having uh, the school in Nouakchott. Mauritania, because it's uh, in, the safe region, in the safe country within the region. So on the uh, capacity building, uh, we, had, we hired African experts who were able to develop content, modules. We have uh, modules, and we had, uh, in, back in May, we did the Train the Trainer program, where we brought 70 African experts from all the regions, and by the way, they are not only uh, government, they are from civil society, business, academia. It's a mixed bag. We brought them to Addis Ababa. We trained them on IG, and they are our ambassadors in the regions, and we call them our trainers. So whenever there is an event at the national level or the regional level, we ask them and we support them to go and train uh, at, those, at the national level and the regional level as well. <clears throat> So, so under and and, and at PID, I think we wanted to be able to ask to answer the questions and create value for 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 the community at different level. Uh, furthermore, on the capacity building, we are uh, collaborating with the uh, Diblo Foundation. Uh, in fact, the, the 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 content that we we developed, we wanted Diblo to fine tune it and make sure it's 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 uh, it's also good for on online consumption. And we also want to develop a specific content for diplomats uh, with the help of uh, Diplo Foundation. Um, moreover, we want to make sure that uh, whatever we are doing is sustainable. So that's why we also, Diplo is helping us with the study on the sustainability of training. Whether it be it, uh, using the school, the model we use today, uh, every time we have an IGF at the national, regional, continental level, we, it's preceded by a school on internet governance. So is that going to be the platform that is going to be sustainable, or there's going to be some other ways of capacitate uh, uh, stakeholder within uh, the member states? So Deep Blue is helping us also on this front. Um, I think I'll stop at that, and then maybe if there's follow-up questions, I'll be Thank, thank you very much, Hadel. And uh, I, I, I think I still have like uh, five or uh, seven minutes, ten minutes, to hear uh, from, uh, f again, from um, the floor. So um, there were, um, yeah, there were comments back at the back. Again, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Makan Fai. Uh, UN retiree, 
have several of my colleagues here. Hello, I greet you <laughs> here on the high table. Uh, I'm at the other side of the table now. Uh, I'm happy to see all of you here. Uh, I am now uh, uh, working at, with the African uh, Internet Governance Forum as the secretary, and uh, the West African Governance Forum as the chair of the scientific committee. So I'm still uh, in the business. Uh, I was not here when we started, uh, but I would like to pay tribute to our uh, colleague Tariq Kamel, who passed away, who was a very big asset on IG and ICT for development issues on the African continent. Uh, after that, uh, I've heard what you have said. You have uh, all spoken uh, uh, on valuable issues, and you have defended your position. Uh, one thing I would like really to uh, stress upon is the need for collaboration between the MENA and the African region. Uh, because uh, some of the countries in the MENA are part of the African region and they are full member, members and active members of the African IGF. But uh, we hear about MENA only when we have the global IGF. I think this should be corrected and we should find ways and means on working together so that uh, our uh, programs are working smoothly from a continent to another continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, McCain, um, and very inspiring, of course, comments, and thank you for the tribute. Um, I also invite you, if you have any questions, to actually um, address them. Comments or questions, please, are most welcome, please. Hello, uh, my name is Iba Aweshe. I'm from Syria. Uh, I'm just, um, I, I think, that I want to add my voice to Christine when she talked about the convergence, the recent convergence between ITU and the ITUD specifically and the other actors in the field of internet governance when it comes to capacity building. I think we need to stress a fact that uh, ITU is a historically a respected organization amongst Arab countries in general. And uh, the Arab group is very well presented there and very actively participating. That, um, the, and the, the issue of internet, is, internet governance issues are quite uh, controversial in several aspects. And even if you are telling the right thing, you can't be mistrusted at one moment because of perceptions, as uh, our friend Shafiq said. Uh, uh, even when, because in, in several cases, uh, what is being said is not the most important, but who is saying it? So probably uh, the role of the ITU could be, and the ITUD specifically again, uh, could be very welcome in trying to, uh, to provide a more credible and more respected uh, point of view amongst all these countries uh, who are more keen on listening to them than what could happen if this message is delivered by someone else. Even if it's true, I'm not. I'm not the, 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 the debating this. Okay, uh, and the, the more initiative, uh, initiatives in this field are more than welcome, and uh, and I think that um, well, given that this is about capacity building, uh, it's not easy to come with a neutral. Uh, with the neutral uh, uh, content on internet governance because it's it's a very conf very controversial issue, a lot of controversial issues, especially if you talk about the old concepts about uh, critical resources and things like that. Now with the, with the new, uh, new issues in, in internet governance are less controversial, but the controversy is still there at, at, at a certain extent. So it's, it's uh, let me say, thanks for the ITU for what, what it has done, and we, we hope that it will always be there. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, any reflections, uh, maybe from uh, the panel? Does someone want to take uh, mic, or do we have more from the floor? Okay. I will please. Um, I just want to talk about the engagement by the uh, North Africa region. 
within breeder uh, context. Um, we have a good engagement uh, with the region. Uh, in fact, we had, uh, before we came here, we had a consultation workshop uh, in Addis Ababa where we presented uh, PRIDA IG implementation strategy. And uh, I think it's one of the region who actually st stood up and uh, they told us they would like to uh, engage more and, and, and kind of have form a, um, a working group around the strategy. Uh, I'll be glad to share the strategy with, with you if you uh, indulge us. Um, they want to have more engagement, having a working group to make sure that the specificity of the Northern Africa and Europe taken into account when it comes to the implementation of the IG strategy for Africa under PRIDA. And we welcome that. And actually, this, this was something very notable uh, in the meeting where uh, the, we had, uh, I think we had very good uh, resources in the North Africa region. I think we need to utilize those, these resources to make sure that we don't, we are not going to subscribe to some one, one size fits all. We wanted to make sure that we address the specificities of the region individually, and, 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 and so and the, the region will be able to tell us what are the priorities and what needs to be addressed uh, from the regional perspective. Okay, um, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I wanted to, um, to make a comment on the two interventions. Um, Maybe first, uh, Makan, and I'm very happy to see you. Uh, we have seen each other a lot in, in, in throughout our careers, so it's nice to see you back in different functions. Um, um, we are actually experimenting also with having joint uh, workshops across the across regions. We have done it on other topics, and I will. I think the I think you have make a very valid point. Um, I will also relay this to my colleagues in the respective um, regional offices to see um, if in the future we could uh, have something, if there is, if that is a, a wish to have some joint cross-regional um, uh, capacity development workshops. We have trialed this on other topics and it, it was quite successful. On, um, thank you very much for your comments um, on uh, concerning ITU. In fact, uh, I didn't mention that, but that was also one of our um, approaches when we started to develop these capacity development programs on internet governance, uh, trying to have a, a to offer a neutral platform. Maybe you say it's not possible, but uh, or maybe put not easy, but put it differently. Uh, we wanted to bring in diverse views, at least, to not have just one view. So this is also the idea of bringing in partners who work on, who have different angles and different perspectives, so that the, um, the policy makers get exposed to all of them and not just to one. So this is also why we are um, emphasizing uh, the importance of working with other partners in the delivery of the of the workshop uh, precisely to, to bring in uh, the, the diverse um, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. You can pass uh, to Madame. Yes, very quickly, just a few tweets. So um, I think maybe in terms of capacity building, maybe we can um, take it a, a step forward and think about um, institutional capacity building. Um, I think it's important to have this institutionalized somehow within uh, the region. This would help building the right uh, teams in place. I don't think relying on one person who took the capacity building uh, is enough to follow up the very broad spectrum of topics uh, that are being discussed, like uh, Vlada mentioned. Um, so we need a variety of uh, skills, a variety of uh, calibers, a variety of backgrounds that would definitely not be available in one person but in a, a cohesive team. This team could be built, built uh, across the region, by the way, and, and uh, across um, Africa and, and the Middle East, of course. Uh, but I think it's time to, to do this um, institutionalization. 
um, and also um, not only building the teams, but also building the appropriate channels at the national level, reaching out to um, other relevant uh, parts of, uh, of the community. We are talking about uh, data protection, about GDPR, at the same time about human rights and technical issues. So it's very difficult to have just uh, one person uh, carrying all this over. And should we manage to do this, we will then have a good um, succession, uh, a good handover. So again, when this specific person leaves uh, or gets promoted or whatever, then we, we don't witness a drop. So again, this is more of food for thought. Um, I fully agree with Ayman on the impact and the importance of the impact. I would just cautious immediate impact versus long long-term impact because sometimes you need to continuously uh, engage until you reach the impact and and I, i'll stop here i know we're running out of time I'm uh, sorry. just quick reactions from uh, vlada shafi and uh, fahd if you want to. Uh, okay uh, just uh, two comments small comments first uh, yes uh, i totally agree with the vlada on uh, this silos uh, this is another issue that we are facing when we do this capacity building. So uh, when we do this capacity building, the middle or uh, level people or technicians or, or uh, technical managers, and uh, we want to uh, deliver the message to decision makers, we have an obstacle here because culturally these people, they can't go up and talk freely to their managers. So we need to go up to the managers and talk to them that we did this and this and this and this. they said, okay, we'll talk to these people and then they will go to talk and there's no follow up. And uh, second, uh, you talk about uh, Minog, uh, Christine. Minog is a very interesting and I think a platform to, to use it. Why we don't use Minog for all these uh, internet governance issue? Because Minog is there, we have two uh, parallel, uh, two, two, uh, two uh, paths. We have the training, we do capacity building for three days, and we have conference for two days where we deliver and share uh, the knowledge uh, regarding technical and uh, regulation. So uh, let's try to have this platform, which is neutral, which is very successful. Next year will be in Bahrain in March, I believe. So let's try to use it, it's there. And we can build on our uh, expertise that we have uh, to have some, some kind of institution, uh, but let not us uh, try to start everything from scratch. We have the base, this institution. Thank you. Uh, on, on the cross-regional uh, cooperation, uh, and I again s s emphasize the, the uh, possibilities of the online, so walking the talk. We usually disregard that, particularly the Middle East, Balkans as well, is the, is the uh, culture of, of meeting face to face, you know, sitting, discussing. But online training programs, and I'm not just talking about, okay, Diplos online course, which is interactive. There are various ways. You can do online briefings, online webinars. There are many ways you can do online. It's much less costly. It can be much more in-depth, actually, sometimes than meeting face to face. Of course, it has to go blended. But it's one, one thing to always think about the online op opportunities are great. And the second point is on, on the um, cross stakeholder, if you wish, uh, the new topics that are on the agenda. We shouldn't stick to the things which, have, which we have been discussing in the last 10 years. I mentioned artificial intelligence. It is a highly controversial topic. It might not seem so. But just take a look at embedding the ethics or principles into AI. The ethics and principles in Middle East, in Asia, in Europe, in US are completely different. Embedding it into AI, which is going to become a global thing, is, is a matter of geopolitics. These things are uh, not only very important to discuss already, but they're actually very sexy, if I may say, to the um, politicians, diplomats, because AI, yeah, I want to be an expert in AI. I want to talk about that. Try to embed these new topics. Talk about AI from different perspectives, from economic, um, security perspectives, human rights perspectives, humanism. We, we have this session tomorrow on humanism and AI. So these are the approaches. And just a quick comment on what Fahd mentioned. At the end, when we are packaging that, we used to be packaging that as IG. We don't have to do that. It can be IG. It can be digital policy. It can be data policy, data governance. It can be digital cooperation. Name it the way you want. As long as we stick to what we know what we are talking about, whether that's Diplos taxonomy or any, anything else, just pack it differently so that it, it appeals to the target group you want. Thanks. Thank you. 
very quickly, and yes, we need to close this segment. Very, very quickly. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't talk about PRIDA. You know, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of perspective uh, and overview of PRIDA. It has three tracks, one to do with spectrum, right? And the second one, harmonization of ICT policy and regulation. And the last uh, is to do with IG. Uh, so, so these are the overall. Uh, part of BRIDA also, we are building a digital platform where we have rooms where people can exchange ideas. And I think the, the, uh, the objective is to be able to have a common position. Like when, before you go to these kind of meetings, then uh, somebody would throw a document, right? And then the document is going to be deliberated among the stakeholders that are in the room. And then eventually there's going to come up a, a position on that document and then now we don't talk about many people attending, maybe one person can attend the meeting and then reflect the position that reads in this room. And there is also a, another room that is going to be for, for policy maker at the government level, where if they don't want the information to be shared with others, they can have one-on-one -on -one interaction. And this is spe specifically before you go to bilateral, multilateral discussion. If you are unsure about what to do, what kind of uh, issues, then the, the person will get advice from the expert on the possible positions and option that they can take to this bilateral or multilateral meeting so that they can be coached before going to these meetings. Uh, so this is general, but tomorrow at um, noon we will have more discussion about PRIDA in our session, African Union Open Forum, 12 noon. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Fred, do you have one? You're okay? You're okay. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, the panelists and uh, it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, on the panel. Uh, thank you for our audience. We are not, we are not finished yet. Uh, so we are coming to the, actually, the more interesting and uh, more broad uh, segment of, of this uh, event. Uh, segment two of this event will look at initiatives in the region um, part of it is uh, national, part of it is regional. Uh, we will have uh, Hanan leading us. So we can, if you wish, we can have a few minutes just in the room, just to stretch yourself uh, for the time for our speakers to get to their seats, but uh, please keep in the room. And uh, if you would, those in the room, if you want to take your seats as well,
Hi, um, gentlemen, ladies. Okay, I'm just. Excuse me, Ayman, Hisham. Okay, we. Uh, I would like to call the uh, next panelists uh, to come to the um, to the podium. Hi. Whenever, whenever. I think I'm I'm gonna take the stage and. Hi, Zena. Okay, I think we're just missing Ayman. We would like to maybe um, settle down. First of all, thank you all for um, staying in the room and uh, putting up with us. I hope the second segment of this uh, interesting meeting will be um, as active and interactive. Um, so thank you Hisham and NTRA with the support of ISOC uh, to um, invite me for, for, this, um, for this event and I think the first part was really a very important discussion. Uh, we will build on it. There was a lot of uh, talk already about digital policy um, so we will go a bit deeper here. We have an excellent uh, panel, um, gender balance and everything which is which is good news. My name is Hanan Bujemi, and I'm the executive director of Tech Policy Tank. It's um, a newly established consultancy helping governments, companies, and different actors with their digital strategy, uh, working mainly on legal and policy analysis um, and strategic advice. Um, I have other roles, namely um, vice chair of the Arab IGF. I set up the North African IGF. Um, and I work in different capacities with different, you know, organizations. You probably know I'm associated with Diplo Foundation. I recently joined the PRIDA program as an expert, so I'm helping them with the implementation since I also specialized in implementing large-scale programs specific to IG. Um, so today, uh, I think the focus of the session will be mainly on digital policies, the challenges that we face in the region, are we instrumental really in influencing policy in our local context regionally and then globally? So the first session was more about engagement, about the different stakeholders that are doing a lot of work in this field already for quite some time. Um, work which is led by excellent colleagues for, for, for a long time. I really know them doing a lot of work to make you know things happen in general. Um, and even though we still lack, you know, influence from the Middle East, you know, in the global context, which is really, really challenging because the lack of capacity, the knowledge gap, and the priorities. So we know that digital policy uh, or internet governance specifically does not feature high in the agenda of governments from our region for many, 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 many uh, uh, reasons. Um, Having said that, there is still you know, work that is being done. We're not gonna wait for things to be 100% okay for us to be this work because there is a large group of people from the region who are already doing great work and we should just build on that, support that, and carry on. Uh, so without further ado, I think uh, it would be good you know, I know everybody on the panel very well, but I would like to give them the space, you know, to also introduce, you know, uh, themselves. I have Zena, I have Sasha from uh, UNESCO, I have a veteran, you know, of IG, and, you know, he plays a big role in many policy processes. Tijani from Tunis, of Eamon Shirini, is the chief of ICT division of UNESCO. We have uh, Kusaya Shati from Kuwait, uh, he's one of the founding members of the Arab IGF. He was actually the first convener of the Arab IGF in Kuwait in 2012. He's AMAC chair, he, you know, he was uh, first, like previously MAG on the global IGF, many, many roles. We have Nadira Raji from Palestine. She's a civil society uh, activist and uh, quite prominent in different fora, mainly ISOC and ICANN, and she's very active in the Asia Pacific region, but also many region. And we have Jane Coffin from ISOC, a VP, a senior VP advisor to the CEO of um, Internet Society. They all bring a lot of experience. They have concrete on the ground experience on how to develop digital policy in our, um, in our region. So um, maybe, 
you know, to start with Jane because she's got this kind of zoom out scope. She <laughs> works globally, but she's very familiar uh, with, with the context of the Middle East. And if you may uh, just shed some light, you know, of your experience in developing digital uh, policy in the context of the Middle East and the role of ISOC specifically uh, in doing so. And if you would like, you can, you know, be more specific uh, talking about you know, the work that you're doing on community networks because access is still one of, you know, the key issues uh, that we um, actually have in the regional uh, context. So, Jane. There we go. Um, hello, and thank you for being here, and thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Jane Coffin. I work at the Internet Society and focus on infrastructure and connectivity. And um, I will give you a quick overview of some great work we're doing in the region. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize um, Nermeen El Sadani, who is from Egypt. She is the regional vice president for the Internet Society. And I sent her a quick note earlier, and I said, no, make sure I, I get all the points in. You want me to get in? Um, we have two studies that we're working on right now from this high-level perspective. One is the um, enabling environment for policy uh, for infrastructure, and there will be a separate focus also on internet exchange points. IXPs are, are a localized version of the internet in a country. When you have them, you have cheaper, better, faster internet. We help build those around the world, and our team um, that's done work in um, sub-Saharan, northern Africa, and around the world has probably been responsible with partners, of course. We don't do anything alone. Um, for putting in more IXPs than anyone uh, that I know as far as uh, in the nonprofit and the for-profit side of the house. Um, so that enabling environment report will be out in January. Um, we've, we're conducting a um, public ask right now for comments on that report. The second report we're working on is one on security in the region, more on infrastructure security, so more of the cybersecurity perspective. So there's another call out right now for comments from colleagues so please take note if you're on any of our mailing lists and our chapter lists. Uh, we do try and reach out to our community to get feedback. Now that is often complicated when you have a report of that size and nature. But again, two things, the enabling environment in general with internet exchange points and infrastructure there and cybersecurity slash security for infrastructure. And as you've said, um, Hanan, some of what we do is take a look at that global level, then it dive down into the regional. And right now, some of the other regional work that we're doing, and I will make a nod to the panel before that spoke about the importance of um, different, uh, different political uh, changes in the region, but also the work we're doing with government. This is a shift change for us on the nonprofit side. Um, recently, I was in um, Riyadh at the end of July, beginning of um, August. We've done more work with the region and the government there than in a long time. And this is on um, the enabling environment, and it was at the request of the ministry and the regulator in Saudi to work with them. And we really appreciated the great collaboration. And we're doing internet exchange point development work with them there as well, and actually a team is going tomorrow. I was there, uh, so we've had three, three different meetings in the last, I say, three or four months. We've been in Bahrain, Jordan, um, Oman as well. So there's more and more work that will be done both on this internet exchange point side, which is that localized internet development. Content will, of course, come into the question. There's always this other issue of security, which is coming through, how to secure information, and how to continue to build up that, um, that infrastructure. Now, this also goes into, um, someone had mentioned earlier, the ITU. We work closely with the development sector, and I'm a vice rapporteur in one of the study groups. And it's important that we do more and more work um, together collaboratively. And we were on a panel at WISIS in March, and we had um, UNCTAD, WTO, ITU, the Internet Society, APC. So we had civil society, UN organizations talking about the importance of collaborative policymaking, collaborative infrastructure work together. And I think this is where we're seeing more and more of a, of a happy breakdown versus a siloing of we should do this and someone else should, should do that. Um, so this is top of mind for us uh, to try and see where we can work collaboratively. Sometimes what people will say is, oh, that's just a small thing you're doing. Well, it's not small when you're working with ICANN and ISOC and 
the team at RIPE NCC and any of you, will we go in together? Someone had said, oh, you know, you go in and you tell, and we do not tell. <laughs> we go in and listen. It is very important that to us that we're asked to come in to work as a partner, but also we don't know all the countries that well. We know a lot about the region, but when we go in, we go in with local people, and part of the key thing that we try and do is what I call local, local. Local training for local people for sustainability. I used to work on big aid projects years ago um, in the former Soviet republics. And I will tell you that you can come in for years and do work on certain projects, but if you're not collaborating across organizations, you might as well have, I said, thrown the money out the window of the plane as you flew over the country. Because if you are competing as organizations in a region, it's much less effective. And so I've been doing this a long time, and I believe that some of this very strategic focused work is far more sustainable and scalable, and this goes to community networks as well. These are small localized networks. They are not illegal. We had this long debate um, with some people recently who said, gosh, these are small networks that are coming in at a local level. Local people are helping design them. These are ways to connect the unconnected. We're trying to look at ways to change the old policy regulatory models, not to overturn spectrum policy overnight. Do not worry. <laughs> if you're in the room, I've, I've had a lot of experience in this area, and people say, gosh, Jane. And I said, nothing's changed. If we've been doing this for 20 years and people are still unconnected, we have a problem. We have got to do something. And so instead of calling those people who are unconnected at the last mile, let's call them the first mile. Connecting from the local instance out, working with people to train them how to build those networks and how to train each other for sustainability. So this is a critical factor of what we've been doing. You have to take care when you're working at that local level, and we work very closely with governments to make sure that they don't think we're doing something that is um, inappropriate to their rules. But we do want to see if we can change the, the way people think about licensing and small networks. Yeah. No, thank you, Jane. I think the example that you brought up is, is very important to highlight is the level of collaboration among the technical community and how you decided to you know, all work together uh, to channel your efforts because the objective is one, is to help you know, all these countries improve at the level of you know, policy implementation. Um, and I think that, that is, um, that is a, a very good asset for the region. You just have to work out, obviously, the cultural differences and how each you know, country in the Middle East and North Africa is quite distinct you know, in the way it does things, which makes your job a little bit more tricky. And I know that you have you all have a great team of people uh, who are very, very experienced in dealing with uh, governments uh, in our region. So I will kind of ask you straight away, what are the challenges, you know, apart from, you know, the cultural diversity before I move on to somebody else, what are, you know, the, the nitty gritty, you know, of what you do and how do you kind of tackle it, you know? So, you're not very familiar, you said, with you know, how things are done and you get the support from other people, but what are the challenges and how do you tackle them? I think the challenge often for nonprofits is that um, we're a very technical neutral group. We have people who are very experienced from um, many years, but we come in with that technical trust. Often it's hard for governments to believe that we're, um, I don't wanna say, uh, but I would like to say an equal partner. And so it's taken some time, and we participate in a lot of those UN meetings as well at the ITU in order to talk to governments about the importance of working with us. Because we're not there to, um, we're not just gonna jump in country and then jump back out. We've watched people do that, and that's not something we believe in. We think you're in for the longer haul. Mm -hmm. It's a three to four to five year process. It depends on, on the country, as you've said. But also, some governments are afraid to change the rules. And so if you can show them that the older rules are not working to connect people with the new internet infrastructure and the way content's delivery, uh, being delivered, then that actually is something, when you show them the models that work in other places in the region, mm -hmm. then they start to see that they can create that uh, sort of newer way of working. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And I, I, I confirm that having a vision, you know, more or less than actually a short-term plan is more um, valuable uh, and it generates more uh, results uh, when you're working in the context 
of the Middle East, and um, maybe this is a good, you know, um, uh, opportunity for me to turn to Sasha because she's working on a very important project that was launched recently uh, by UNESCO, um, uh, the uh, indicators, and you mentioned briefly to me before the meeting that you actually apply them to two countries in the Middle East, and uh, if you may maybe shed light more on that experience, and I know that you just basically launched them, and you're still uh, deliberating on, on, on these indicators, so you, you might uh, bring us to the picture on what's going on on that front. Thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be here today, and also on a panel with many of our very close partners including the Internet Society that have been a central part in the work that we've been doing and looking at the development of our Internet Universality Framework and Internet Universality Indicators. Uh, so just very briefly uh, to highlight what uh, the indicators and also the concept that's guiding this work is. Uh, we work, as many of you in the room are very familiar with, all around the world, and we have several field offices on the ground working very closely not only with government counterparts, but also with counterparts from civil society and from the technical community to look at how to ensure that the internet is harnessed to meet the sustainable development goals. And so in 2015, our member states at our general conference adopted what we call the Internet Universality Framework. And this framework is guiding our work on internet, but also more broadly on our work on digital transformation, including uh, right now our work on artificial intelligence and the ethical dimensions specifically of artificial intelligence. So what is the Internet Universality Framework? Basically, this framework underlines that in order for the internet to be harnessed to contribute to sustainable development, the internet must be rights-based. So all rights that exist offline exist in the online environment. It must be open, it must be accessible, and it must be multi-stakeholder. And that without these three these four principles, we cannot actually harness the internet for the future we want and for sustainable development. So following the adoption of this internet universality framework in 2015, for over three years and with many partners, including some in the room, we worked to develop the internet universality indicators. And these indicators used a multi-stakeholder process in order to consult with various actors on the ground at the local level and also at the global level to say, okay, okay, if we want to harness the development of the internet to contribute to sustainable development, what needs to be done? And the result is an instrument that was welcomed by our member states uh, at the most recent meeting of UNESCO's International Program for the Development of Communication in November 2018. And since then, we have begun applying these indicators in partnership with national counterparts at the local level. And as you underline, uh, first and foremost, in the Middle East and North Africa region, in Tunisia and in Sudan. So what are the objectives, concretely, of this Internet Universality Indicators Framework? First of all, it presents a comprehensive and substantive understanding of the national internet environment and policies, because in order to assist governments in developing inclusive policies for the internet, we first need to ensure that a gaps analysis exists to say, okay, well, what is missing in order to ensure a Rome-compliant, let's say, internet? The second is to assess the alignment of the environment and policies to these four principles, rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder. And the third is based on this analysis to develop policy recommendations and practical initiatives that enable at the country level uh, the governments to develop inclusive policies through multi-stakeholder approaches that ensure that the internet ecosystem and advanced ICTs contribute to sustainable development. So what concretely do these indicators look like? There are five categories of indicators, four of which reflect the Rome principles, and the fifth which is concerned with cross-cutting issues, so things like gender equality, needs of children and young people, the economic dimensions of the internet, trust and security, and legal and ethical aspects of the internet. And here I'd just like to salute my dear friend from the ITU who is in the room because we work very closely with the ITU having complementary mandates, the ITU specifically on issues related to infrastructure, and UNESCO in the follow-up to WISIS looking specifically at questions of you know, multilingualism online, for example. How do languages, and this is a huge issue in the Middle East and North Africa region, how does, for example, the presence of the Arabic language on the internet ensure the production of local content that meets the needs of local communities. 
These internet universality indicators, there are 303 indicators. Of these, 110 are the core indicators for basic level assessments of national internet contexts. So the way we look at these indicators is that they are a toolbox, not only for governments, but also for civil society and NGO actors on the ground to be able to undertake gaps analysis to really understand what needs to be done in order for the internet to take its rightful place in sustainable development. And here again, I'm not talking just about access to the internet, but use of the internet to ensure that specifically here, marginalized groups like young people, like indigenous communities, like women, can actively be producing local content and local solutions using the internet that contributes to sustainable development. So what are some of the challenges to preempt perhaps one of the questions that you may ask in implementing these indicators? Uh, the first is that obviously it requires careful planning. It also requires sufficient time and resources for effective data gathering. And one of the things that we're seeing on the ground is that this question of collecting data is a real issue because many governments do not have centers for data or statistical offices. So how do you say, okay, well, here are these great indicators. Let's get data to identify gaps analysis, when in fact, one of the first things that needs to be done is to un understand and ensure, for example, the challenges on the ground in ensuring appropriate statistics and access to data that could guide informed policy making. Uh, here also another uh, uh, challenge, I would say, is to ensure that this process is inclusive. This is not a government-only led process. This is a process that is multi-stakeholder, so that involves civil society, that involves the technical community, and that involves uh, NGOs, for example, on the ground that are doing informed work. So here we're also reimagining the way in which public policy related to the internet is undertaken, where it is no longer a top-down policy development by governments alone, but an inclusive public policy approach. So this is another aspect of our work is to say, okay, well, how can we reimagine, thanks to the internet, and thanks also to artificial intelligence, the way in which we collect input and data from multi-stakeholder consultations in order to ensure inclusive public policies. Very briefly, just to kind of give an overview of what the implementation of these indicators means and how we go about it. There are really kind of eight steps to how we see the implementation of these indicators. The first is establishing a multi-stakeholder advisory group to ensure that this process is indeed participatory. The second is building a collaborative research team to make sure that the different stakeholder groups, so technical community, academia, civil society, the media, the government, and the private sector, which play a huge role in the way in which internet infrastructure and access is rolled out at the national level, is around the table from the beginning to ensure inclusive internet policies. The third is developing a research plan. And here again, I'd like to underline uh, specifically for the MENA region, is saying, okay, well, what infrastructures, as it concerns, you know, for example, uh, Department of Statistics exists in the actual ecosystem that we can rely on, and how can UNESCO, with its partners, reinforce the development of this ecosystem to ensure inclusive research? The fourth aspect is really data gathering and data analysis, which looks at how to make sure that we collect this data to informed, informed public policy development. And then uh, the two last tasks is really looking at developing a national validation workshop and related advocacy activities. Because it's hard to say we need to work towards harnessing the internet for sustainable development, where many people on the ground, if you go up to a young person who's 13, for example, and thinking about how they, what they would like to study in high school, they don't necessarily understand why this issue is directly relevant to sustainable development. And again, in partnership with the ITU and the framework of WISIS follow-up, we've looked at mapping specifically how the WISIS follow-up action lines relate to sustainable development. And a huge part of that is also related to internet access and internet use. And then the last task is really looking at impact assessment and monitoring. So how can we not only develop the public policy, but look at how we need to uh, backstop uh, national counterparts in the implementation, because there are lots of very beautiful policies out there. But the difference between the policy and the actual implementation is also another huge gap that we're looking at. And so these multi-stakeholder groups really serve as a platform to ensure both development, implementation, and monitoring so that we can adapt accordingly 
accordingly with a very, very fast changing and disruptive tech ecosystem in Middle East and North Africa, how we can make sure that these policies are adaptable and inclusive and keep up to the speed with the actual technological developments on the ground that are going on. Oh, thank you, Sasha. That, that was amazing. You know, I'm, I'm really impressed you know, by the, the work that you're doing. And I think it sets the benchmark for policy making you know, at the global level. And I think it will increase the level of acceptance uh, of how uh, digital policy making should be inclusive. And I think being UNESCO and other UN institutions leading this process, it will be more appealing you know, to governments you know, from uh, the Middle East to adopt and adapt also uh, this uh, specific process. So I'm not sure if you have any outcomes yet about you know, the implementation or the application of the universal indicators in the case of Tunis, Tunisia, and Sudan. Was it Sudan? Mm -hmm. Yes. So just briefly, you know, quickly, what have you kind of noticed from your initial exercise with these two countries? So this is uh, en cours, in progress, okay. in Tunisia and Sudan. Right. Uh, but what I would invite uh, uh, member states who are around the table today and also civil society organizations who are here, uh, we have a policy of open access. Mm -hmm. So all of our work is published uh, openly online, including obviously the in uh, internet universality indicators and, free and framework. So they are uh, downloadable for free mm -hmm. in several languages, uh, also including in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I would invite uh, countries and, and uh, counterparts here today to consult that. Uh, the assessments will be available online. I'd like to underline here, though, that in no way is this tool indicated to say, okay, Tunisia is better than this other country. Yeah. and then no, this other. It's not at all a no. ranking. It's really a toolbox that's uh, being used on the ground to assist in digital transformation and public policy mm -hmm. making. So in no way are these indicators meant to rank countries as it concerns their internet development, mm -hmm. but really used as a toolbox to ensure multi-stakeholder engagement in public policy making. We will be sharing the results uh, of these uh, uh, indicator applications, mm -hmm. uh, including actually this morning and this afternoon in our open forum dedicated to this question, specifically to ensure uh, lessons learned and best practices and challenges encountered between different regions. So the open, uh, the day zero event that we held today and actually an open forum that will occur in a couple days in the framework of the IGF really looks at providing platforms to exchange best practices between the different regions because as you underlined, challenges that are encountered, for example, in Middle East and North Africa mm -hmm. may indeed be different than the challenges encountered in applying these indicators in the South Pacific or in Asia. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think showing somehow that there is some kind of competition between countries is also not desired practice, but it would be good to actually measure the uptake mm -hmm. uh, of how to apply these indicators because then it will help us all move forward as far as, you know, policy implementation is concerned. Now, thank you very much, Sasha. That thank was you. really, really very helpful. And, um, you know, with that, I think it's time to zoom in now and speak about the Middle East and, uh, you know, specifically what's, what are the kind of initiatives in place at the moment in terms of uh, digital. And I think the best person to maybe start with would be um, Ayman Shirbini, who is the head of the ICT division of uh, UNESCO. And um, I think Ayman, you know, and his team you know, is here with us today, do a lot of work and collaborate with many, many governments on different fronts. So it would be good if Eamon can um, give his point of view on when it comes to the current digital initiatives, um, digital policy initiatives taking place in, in the MENA region uh, before we uh, jump on. Uh, okay, Th issues. thank you so much, Hanan. I'm trying to raise my voice to keep some energy flowing uh, for the la remaining one hour. So actually, I'm going to speak with uh, sometimes two hats. Uh, one hat is mine, which is the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, and one hat for my main close partner, which is the League of Arab States. Myself, my team, and the last are tomorrow doing an open forum related to uh, these topics in details from a very regional perspective, and it is open forum 21. It is after tomorrow. It is from 5.20 till 6.20. Uh, uh, don't remember the room now, but we will give more detail. So. Back to the, my original hat, which is the United Nations. First of all, I'd like to make one very good announcement that uh, the UN is undergoing a, a very uh, uh, creative and, uh, let us say, uh, uh, disruptive, maybe uh, reinventing itself. So part of the reinvention is uh, actually, and I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Secretary General, both of you have read about that, but uh, uh, I'm happy that I have also here with me 
Sasha from UNESCO, and I managed to uh, keep uh, 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 Susan for some time before she leaves at 5.30. But the idea of One UN, the One UN thing has been there for some time, but uh, uh, not even related to the crossing line 2015, which of course I'll speak about, but related uh, to several uh, leadership uh, uh, eras, uh, last of which was Ban Ki-moon, and then Mr. Guterres, now our Secretary General. We are uh, undergoing three types of reform at the same time, the most important of which uh, uh, it is not the planning reform, while it is that important, it is not the management and organization reform, but most um, important is the developmental reform. We have new philosophy to development. We are acting not only as one UN with all the organizations, but we are also working with the multi-stakeholder approach more and more. We are uh, outreaching to all the players. Not only that, but in fact, we are actually reinventing our partnership. The Secretary General have convened uh, for a year from 2018 till 2019, the SG High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. And uh, most of us have read the Digital Cooperation. For me, as if I'm reading the WISIS and the IGF once again, but a new incarnation. This is something that we are keen on bringing to the region. The Arab IGF is coming very soon. Uh, it was supposed to be next month, but because of uh, some problems in the region regarding political, uh, uh, geopolitical issues, we just moved it uh, to after Christmas vacation. So mark your calendar, 15 and 16 of January. We are going to speak about the topic that is going to be our main talk tomorrow in the morning, plenary session one of IGF Berlin, digital cooperation, is going to be our main plenary in the Arab IGF. We've been watching closely this kind of uh, proposed new dynamics, co-governance, uh, co new ecosystems, IGF+, plus all these things we are going to bring to the region. We have been also in a retreat for two years trying to reinvent the Arab IGF post-2015, post the, the SDGs, post-2030 agenda, and we managed to do that. We have a new charter, we have a new roadmap for the 2030. So this is one element regarding the IGF, the global IGF, the Arab IGF, and the idea of focus on digital cooperation. But let me pause and focus again on the, the Arab WISIS, which is the father or the mother of all the foras that we are speaking about. And we have strong, uh, let, let us say, uh, uh, relationship with this uh, founding uh, process where every one of us, whether the ITU, UNESCO, regional commissions, even the, uh, the I-STARS and everyone, have had a partnership ownership role. Uh, the idea of the regional WISIS, we also brought to the region the initiative of the Arab WISIS. It has not been coined as such before 2015. We had like participated in the PREPCOM 1, 2, 3, whatever, be between 2003, 2005, the WIGIG, all these things. One follow-up point in 2009, and another one, 2014, uh, much lighter. So now we are institutionalizing the process starting 2015. We launched a biannual uh, Arab uh, WISIS process, and uh, we have a strong partnership in the region with ITU and uh, UNESCO. Uh, of course, with my other head, with the League of Arab States, who couldn't come uh, today. So that Arab WISIS had uh, taken place in 2017, and in 2019. Last year, I was also with uh, Sasha and ITU, ITU colleague, and we were consulting on the idea of Arab voices. We had also Mukhtar from ECA, and we made it, we made the 2019. And now our next big thing, hopefully, and this is what Hanan asked me to speak about, and Christine also, is that we are looking into synergy between the top processes. It is not logical anymore, not sustainable, not efficient, to do like different, uh, uh, like WISIS uh, versions, one of the WISIS itself, and the Arab IGF, Arab WISIS and Arab IGF, especially after the ITU has opened now its uh, uh, like doors to the uh, internet governance, and uh, 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 already the I-STARS are there in the WISIS process. So what has been always the case before 2015, like this is a community, this is another, the WISIS is one community, the internet governance are the other, now they are merging globally, and we have really to find ways, and this is our discussion for the next year, from today until the General Assembly 75th, when we will uh, hopefully reach the global commitment on digital cooperation. Are we going to merge or suggest merge 
the two processes in the Arab region have something that uh, Vlada has called it even, yes, let, let's call it anything. So let's call it maybe the Arab uh, digital cooperation platform, forum, process, whatever it is. So I hope that uh, these initiatives converge very soon because we have only 11, it's coming very soon, 10 years to go till 2030. Mm -hmm. So at least at the level of the 2020, we should come up also with something at the regional level. Before I, uh, I leave the mic, I'd like to mention that we also have done very important uh, uh, process. That the process is actually based because we are all connecting the dots of the matrix, the famous matrix of the ITU, which is the SDGs with the, the WISIS intersections. They are 200 intersections, roughly speaking, or 100. We cannot, I mean, deal with all of that at the same time. So we decided to do a, a, an Arab digital development report that is based on national digital development reviews every two years, and we move with the high-level political forum, focus on certain SDGs. So mm -hmm. this year, today in the morning, I was finalizing the last touches on that Arab digital development report. You will see it very soon. We'll make a, a, a nice launch about it. It uh, had uh, like contributions from uh, official partners uh, uh, representing 10 Arab countries, and from UNESCO Cairo office, from ITU Arab office, and many others, DESA in New York, and so on. So this is also a, a piece of, of the puzzle. If we now had in mind, for example, to do indicators next iteration, we will not do it. We will work together more. Mm -hmm. You work more indicators, we work on other things, people working in capacity building. Yeah. So it is time, really, for the Arab region to experiment this synergy, complementarity, mm -hmm. and hopefully we bring something new also from the region to the rest of the world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, you know, defining synergies was something that would come in after in the conversation after we actually hammer all the issues at stake. So I'm not drilling on something specific because I know you're the focal point when it comes to dealing with governments from the Middle East. And actually, it's an opportune moment to discuss a little bit in details the challenges you know that you face convincing governments from our region to be more involved in this project uh, in, in this process and more specifically i would like you to share with you know the people in the room at the moment what is considered at stake you know when it comes to digital policy issues uh, for government representatives what are the three priorities on the agenda of governments from uh, our region so we know exactly where we're, we're, we're going, you know, what, what's the trend? Okay, first of all, it relates to my uh, first idea of reinventing <coughs> approaches. I mean, it is not logical for the same government to receive the same content from several players at the same time, not only at the regional level, but m maybe from the global, or maybe from the country also. We have to synergize. We have to look at this kind of domain as a global supply chain. We need really not to, like, co co confuse the recipients or the beneficiaries or the stakeholders, especially that we are not really saying so much different things. So that synergy is very important. It is now about co cooperation and not competition. We want, don't want to distract the recipients about things that are of the past. The other thing relates to the uh, impact, what I spoke in the morning. I am faced always with that question from the governments, from the UN, and from uh, uh, also the partners. What is the outcome of the Internet Governance Forum as a platform? We say policy dialogue, and dialogue means policy shaping, blah, blah. What are these issues? That the are issue of in? impact. What is the impact? No, the but what are the issues at stake, you know, the topic per se? We say cybersecurity, what is it exactly? Okay, it is the forum. It the is the platform, itself. the process. I have heard, unfortunately, when Vlada said that it's about the process, we took a note, me and Mirna here, because this is a, a, something that we believe in. The UN environment now, be, uh, backed by the governments in the General Assembly, say we don't want processes. We want something practical, on the ground, policy change process, not dialogue only. So the, the challenge is to sell the idea or, uh, of just a dialogue without linkages to policy making is the, the biggest challenge. And that brings uh, me to the other hat, which I'm representing, the LAS, or Adel and the uh, AFU, and uh, this kind of bodies, the political uh, uh, umbrellas of regions, 
are very important to get really connected to the dialogue process because we want to give them the digest, the messages we call it, directly to the, from hand to mouth, to the policy making body, which is councils and things like that. This link is still very weak. Very weak and missing. And of course, yeah. the third thing is the, the, uh, the idea of, uh, let us say, uh, agility. Yeah. I mean, we need really to show results in order to snowball. Yeah, and it's unfortunate also that we haven't got think tanks in the region that are specialized on doing research of the impact, you know, of certain technologies and policies on digital economy, on, you know, geopolitics and other issues that are relevant to the region. And I'm not sure w why is that? Uh, is it because digital policy does not feature as a priority in the agendas of, you know, research organizations? and this is in the context of the Middle East, because that will help us shape policies for the future. So that is completely absent, you know, from, from our context. And I'm actually surprised that governments, you know, um, uh, or even companies are not interested in any kind of market analysis, you know, that will help us, you know, shape up these policies for the future. And I don't blame governments, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, having some kind of uncertainty about the role of the IGF because we're not used to have a conversation, you know, about the issues at stake. But it is a good opportunity to do so. We just need to get used to each other. And I see Kosaya shaking his head about this, and maybe he's a very good, you know, person to uh, jump on uh, after to kind of share with us from his own point of view, what does it look like, you know, to kind of convince governments, uh, develop policy about issues that are very sensitive. And I think you've got very good experience in that, so Kasai. Well, uh, thank you, Hanan. Thank you for that. Uh, in the Arab world, we have uh, several digital policies. Well, some of them worked somehow. Some of them didn't work. Some of them were just kept in papers. For example, the, uh, the uh, Arab League were leaders in 2005 or seven. They launched what's called the Arab ICT strategic plan. Um, and it wasn't it kept that way. It didn't, nothing in it has been implemented. Uh, many countries on national level, uh, they develop policies 2020, 2030, 2035, 2050, 2040. But, and they incorporated a digital component into that plan. Uh, well, you cannot consider it a digital policy because the scope of what is called 2020, 2030 is so wide, it's in many sectors. And the digital policy is uh, it's like directed toward uh, supporting all. It doesn't work that. Digital policies first needs to be specific toward something. Uh, is it toward SMEs? Is it toward social inclusion? Empowering women? Uh, it needs to be toward a specific issue. And it needs to be branded for that it's, it's a specific uh, target or uh, issue. More than that, uh, it needs to be localized. So a digital policy needs to be on a national level or a community level or a society level. Even national is wide, possibly. Uh, we cannot say regional digital policy. Uh, it, it needs to be national or focused about a specific society, community, and so on. And we have the status quo on that. Uh, uh, it needs to be tailored toward the socioeconomics of that society or country or community. Um, and then it is not about targets or goals as much as about empowering, enabling, fostering innovation. Uh, it needs to target these. It needs to be so clear in, in, in targeting uh, these. Um, and. Uh, most of all, also creating opportunity. Innovation for what? Uh, if, if innovation will not create opportunities uh, that will help improve the community, society, individuals, people, whatever, uh, then there is no point. We'll, there is no return out of that. Um, and in that sense, it leads us to be a participatory 
استراتيجي وير ات كان هاف دايلوج وير ات كان برينج بيبل اون بورد وير ات كان وين سيرتن سيجمنت لايك يوث ذا يونج جينيريشن ذا يونيفرسيتي ستودنتس اند جرادس اند ذن ذير ار ديجيتال بوليسيز Okay, 2020, 2030, 2035, 2040, 2050. Um, and you may go to the common and you tell them, do you know about these policies? They say, yeah, 2020. Yeah. They are about what? And? Yeah. Well, it's a national plan. We have what in it? It should make sense. Bad. So it means there is a gap between what's this strategy or what is. Yeah. What's this plan? This is like way, high level What's in it for me? So in a way, it needs to be clear, simple, outreached to whoever needs to benefit from that mm -hmm. or, or who wants to participate in it. Uh, so I can know what's in it for me. It can be in my mindset. So if I want to do something, yeah. uh, maybe things are there, yeah. right? Um, then. We create plans, but who leads? Who's the champion? Who's the leader by example? Where did we have success stories before? Not necessarily, not, not necessarily related to these plans, mm -hmm. but it has been, for example, in Kuwait we have two successful stories, not, not relating to Kuwait, but because I know. It's, for example, Taliban.com and uh, uh, what's called carriage. It's all about food delivery, that's fine, but it's a success story. It's an investment that made by a youngsters and someone came and bought these for millions and it's a success story. It's operating till today. We have, for example, maktoub.com at a point. Uh, it was a success story. So are these clear, visible, known, uh, lesson learned from them? Uh, and again, the plans ca should have a sponsorship, a sponsor, an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And the state cannot be the umbrella for all. We cannot say the state need to be, or the government need to be the sponsor. There should be communities, groups, that can be the sponsors. For example, the telcos today, the, the mobile operators in our region, they are all establishing innovation centers. And it's a win-win situation because these, someone there is creating apps, bringing ideas, and they will use the mobile telecom services to implement these ideas. So it's a win-win situation, so they are creating an environment, creating a space, a work space for that. And it's working somehow. Uh, sometimes a great success, sometimes mild success, but it's working. So in, 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 a, in a nutshell, uh, we do have these challenges. It's going so wide scope. And we always talk, we need to have a regional, for example, digital pass. No, for regional, we need to have something like the Internet University, uh, Universality Indicators, where we say each country, we adopt these indicators, need to be targeted, achieved by that date. Uh, but you need to create your own national policy or your own national plan to achieve that target or bring view and at the best position in that indicators. But we don't necessarily need to go regional. And that's it. Yeah, I, th I hear what you're saying. I think, yes, digital policy is more effective and efficient when it's kind of applicable to the local context. But if you heard Kosai, I think his intervention is in line with what Vlada mentioned earlier. It's like he's more bothered about the how. You know, the how we do things is very important. And yes, we can have a regional perspective, but ultimately we need to work a lot harder at the local level to make sure that the, the implemented policies are, you know, relevant to the context. Um, so nicely, you know, from initiatives led by ISOC and, and UNESCO to the processes that Eamon uh, mentioned, plus, you know, the uh, kind of challenges, high level, you know, uh, style. Uh, type of challenges that Kusai mentioned, I would like to move swiftly to the gaps, you know, like identifying the gaps from a perspective of people who are working on the ground, doing a lot of work, you know, with different communities and involved at various levels. And maybe it's good to give the, uh, uh, the floor to Mr. Tijani uh, to um, 
talk us through what he sees, you know, from his own perspective as the gaps, you know, that we see um, in our context. I'm not going to talk probably any more about regional <laughs> because it's, uh, it's, it's maybe good to, to zoom in and, and take Tunisia as, as an example of how, you know, digital uh, policy initiatives are kind of filling the gaps um, at the moment. Um, maybe you share with us as well from your own perspective what you see at the moment as a hot issue that you know is not getting the attention of the community and the different institutions working in, in this field. Tijen. Thank you very much, Hanen. I, uh, I wanted to speak about the various um, uh, internet governance initiatives in which I was involved and try to, to, to give what are, the, what are things that we can do to improve those initiatives because uh, I think there is, uh, 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 there is something to do to make them really effective. Uh, I, I am involved in uh, several uh, national, sub-regional, and uh, regional uh, internet governance forums, uh, such as uh, the African Internet Governance Forum, the Arab uh, Afri uh, Internet Governance Forum, the, as regional, as sub-regional West African uh, Internet Governance Forum, North African Internet Governance Forum, and national uh, IGFs, such as the Tunisian one. So uh, there is, uh, uh, let me first speak about the North African Internet Governance Forum because I, uh, I am among the, the leadership team now of this uh, initiative. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, this forum was uh, created in 2012 in Hammamet. And, uh, um, and then uh, the, the first step, if, uh, uh, I think, in making it effective was in uh, Marrakesh where the charter was uh, approved and a NOMCOM was appointed to select the first MAG, and, uh, it, which was done. And uh, the first Internet Governance Forum for North Africa was uh, held in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. The second was in Hamamat in Tunis, in Tunisia. And uh, the third was held last September in Rabat in Morocco. Uh, this uh, last one, uh, we uh, decided to change, to, to modify or to review the, the charter to avoid the problems we faced uh, uh, during these uh, three uh, uh, first years of this uh, uh, forum. So this is the North African IGF. This uh, initiative has common problems with the other initiatives I, I was speaking about. So this is where you're going to speak about the gap? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the main problem is participation. And uh, uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, the, the forum is an annual forum to discuss public policies related to internet. So it is open to everyone. It is not for engineers to speak about the unique identifiers of internet. It is not only for lawyers to speak about the, the legal aspects of internet. It is for everyone to speak about the problems they are facing about the threat they have, about their children, about their, their privacy, etc. The problem is that we have always the same people participating, a few, not a lot, and mainly local people because of funding, you know, this is always a problem. But this is not a problem. It, the, the main problem is that the participation is very low. And, uh, and even it is uh, of uh, a, a low level. Because after uh, the end of the, of the forum of this year, people will disappear and uh, they, they will not uh, uh, re remember anything. They will, st they will wait for the next year, which is not effective at all. So the, I think that the best way is to try to, to build the, ne the, the networks. We have several networks, for example, for, for North African IGF, we can uh, uh, have the network of the Arab IGF, we, have, we can have the network of the African IGF and take all uh, North African people from them to, to, to be in contact with them, to try to inform them yeah. on, on a regular basis, to, to try to, uh, to ask them about their opinion, about what kind of topic they want to, to see addressed during the, uh, the forum, etc. So the problem of participation is very important and the problem of the quality of participation is important. If we, if we want 
that uh, the, the, the internet uh, community participate in policy development, we need to make them aware and we, we, we need to make them interested and to make them, uh, to make them know that they have to, uh, to ask to participate in the policy development. Yeah. And this cannot happen if they, are not, if they don't understand what is happening, yeah. if they don't participate in the discussion. Uh, because participating in the discussion will make them understand what is the issue, what is the real issue, and how to overcome it. And this is the way to, to, uh, to make them ask to be involved in the policy development uh, uh, about the, the, the internet governance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tijani. I think Tijani brought us back to earth, probably, because he mentioned a very basic issue, participation. It's like we're looking at each other now, and we're like, oh, why is this a problem, you know? I know that organizations are deploying a lot of resources, you know, to uh, organize events, and you want to see new blood in these processes, because you want to feel like you're creating some kind of impact. Um, so it's not only about talking to the same people all the time, and I know how that can be very draining, uh, because uh, it's like we are all the usual suspects, and we all have, you know, uh, good reason to be here, but we also have very good intentions, uh, if I may say. But I hear what you're saying, and I, I have to say also that there is hope. I'd like to be very positive because I have seen progress and I have seen new faces in the latest edition of the uh, summer school on internet governance for the Middle East, which was organized by the chair of the North African IGF, Mr. Aziz Hilali, and it was very successful and it was with a bunch of PhD students that I was very, very overwhelmed you know, to talk to and I felt really like I don't know anything, you know, like they know really more. And it's just a matter of kind of putting more effort into the engagement. And I don't see Fahd anymore in the room. And I know that he's doing a lot of work, you know, on the part of ICANN to the engagement. And I know ISOC also is pulling a lot of resources to make this happen. And luckily we have two hands that we can clap, because huh? you cannot clap with one hand. But the thing is, these efforts are still limited, you know, that, that's not meant to be negative, uh, you know, it doesn't have negative connotation, but I think these people need help, you know, to be able to scale up. So it would be good if, you know, ITU, uh, unfortunately, uh, the lady left the room and maybe UNESCO pull resources together to see how we can scale the work, you know, at the, you know, at the regional level because it's maybe easier. And then also, um, piggyback on other initiatives, important ones like Prida, because Prida has, you know, the basically resources to make things happen. So we have to really take advantage of um, this kind of opportunities and gain momentum so we can bring in more people into this process so we can create a base of people that we can talk with. And I think this is the challenge that I faced myself when I led you know, IGMENA program five, I don't know, six or seven years back. It was, there was nothing. You know, I had to start from zero. And then at the end, you know, we, we could see a little bit of movement, but unfortunately, the momentum, you know, is not kept. So we need to make sure that whatever is happening on the ground, we build on it to make sure that there is some kind of continuity. Otherwise, we'll have Tijani as a veteran coming back to us and say, there is no participation, <laughs> which is, to a certain extent, you know, correct. You know, you, you are, uh, you know, I, I get your point. Um, when, moment. When, one of the initiatives that the North African IGF tried to do is to involve more and more youth people, yeah. young, young people. Oh, it's and, a lot better and, now, and, yeah. And there is two initiatives in this. Uh, uh, one, the Internet Governance School that will be always with the Internet Governance Forum yeah. for, for, uh, for young people. And second, the Youth Internet Governance uh, Forum. Yeah, thank North. you, yes. Yeah. I think the, the, the participation of youth in IGF, in all IGFs now, it's a lot more prominent than, than, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I think you all remember how it used to be, you know, in the last decade of the IGF. But now I think it's improving. And, and you know, to just feed into your conversation before um, ending up with Zena, I will have to go to Nadira because Nadira also have 
a lot of experience on the ground in two, you know, kind of contexts, that is the Asia Pacific and, and the Mene region. And maybe you want to dwell a little bit further on the gaps, you know, that yes. we have uh, in our context. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact I, w I want to thank, first of all, the organizer to include uh, somebody to bring the voice of the civil society, or the, the end user. And uh, one of the gaps I see in uh, the region, there is no n nurturing environment. Uh, not there is, there is, uh, the, uh, people start to contribute, to contribute to the policies, either when they are stuck with uh, some uh, problem or when they find a nurturing environment, environment to pull them into the level uh, by doing, not by uh, going back to the earlier uh, session about the capacity building, not necessary to have to be organized. It could be uh, 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 by doing. Uh, and that's the experience I have uh, uh, when I, I was engaged uh, in, into the, attending the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Internet Governance. And I found that uh, in that region, anybody who are interested to, to join, he can be part of the multi-stakeholder uh, group and, uh, and the program committee. And they, have, they do have work mod modalities. The work modalities when they have rules and procedures, and every year they have to uh, open it to, to everybody, all the comments, the community who participated. And you could see the input coming from newcomers so it's not lack of participation of uh, how to bring people. Uh, it's open, it's it, inclusive, nobody, no selection process. So everybody learn by doing, listening and reading what's going on. So this is another approach of, uh, of uh, uh, this is the nurturing environment which I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I would like to encourage to, uh, to bring to the region as well. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, when I mentioned about uh, when we are stuck, we start working with uh, uh, the digital uh, policies. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the, on, on the national level. Uh, for example, when the, uh, two years ago the cybersecurity was implemented, it, it, it has a lot of uh, 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 kind of control of the freedom of speech. The first effective and being like uh, the, the, a lot of journalists they were being affected by that. And uh, then the think tank, the Palestinian think tank, which they don't bring uh, their research, in, uh, digital research in, into their uh, studies, they start discussing these issues. Even the journalists, uh, syndicates, uh, syndicates also start uh, bringing this uh, initiative. We also, me and Tijani, we uh, also, Fahid is not here, another nurturing environment we, which we, we created in the Middle East. Uh, uh, it's it's community-driven uh, initiative where, uh, uh, where the Middle East, uh, uh, ICAD Middle East group, uh, created that we call Mid, uh, Middle East space where uh, uh, very close to each uh, ICANN meeting will we'll handle one of the issues and we uh, call for participants to, uh, to write a comment on the, the, the discussion, discussion on that and then we do discussion and it, is represent, it will represent the, the regional perspective. So it is by doing, no, learn by doing and getting engaged, and, uh, but also uh, such environment, it, it will help. Another issue about, uh, I was really happy to hear about the, the, the new move of uh, uh, the, uh, the ITU. And I was happy that I was part of uh, the delegate in the, uh, the, play, uh, play, uh, the P, uh, ITU PPT, uh, PPT uh, 18. Uh, and I could see that we, you talked about the Arabic, uh, uh, I heard about the Arabic group, and in fact, I felt alienated because I was not allowed to sit with the group to bring the perspective of the end user. I'm not kind of competing. It's, they have to, uh, to listen that we are working to the multi-stakeholder uh, opinion, different opinion, to bring everybody to the same understanding. It's not for top-down. We need to, he, to, to, go, to go to the grassroots and listen to what is the exact needs. Yeah. No, I get you, I hear you, Nadira. I think she made really good points. I think developing policy can be intimidating in, if you don't uh, know the terminology, understand the concepts, and how to link the dots. Yeah. 
and if you're not well connected as well in this forum, because we all know that there is few people that can get things done. And to do that, you need to have access to a lot of different you know, layers in this forum. And it's not, uh, we shouldn't take this for granted. So if we're bringing new people to, to, to participate, we have to obviously uh, overcome the siloed environment. And I think I heard this conversation in the first panel, uh, and to do that is extremely challenging. Um, and I know other fora where you know, developing policy can take years, you know? So you, you are on the same page with other veterans in the process, but it's not impossible, it's doable, it takes time, and people need to be persistent, but not everybody uh, that we know should be kind of contaminated with what I call the IG bug, because it's a bug. <laughs> and it's like when, when you hit that moment, you understand the issue, you suddenly feel like you want everybody to buy in into what you're doing. But I, I can assure you that it took me a long time to convince people that I know outside of the IG world what I do can be understood, because nobody ever understood what kind of work that I do. So I, I, I do um, feel you and I, I hear you, you know, on the need to kind of have that representation on equal footing with other stakeholders, just because you want your voice to be heard as a civil society uh, member. So thank you very much, uh, Nadira, for that intervention. And last but not least, I'll, I'm turning to Zena. Zena, she's actually the convener of the Lebanese IGF, and she's also um, the head of international cooperation with Ogero, uh, Lebanon. Are you still? Uh, you are still on, okay. Well, you know, your experience is interesting in this panel because you went through everything, you know, to be able to set your, you know, national IGF. And it would be actually good if you can give us a snapshot of how did it go, you know, with you when it comes you know, from the very beginning, like when you got involved uh, in IG to become a magnet member, and now you're trying obviously to influence policy in your, um, in your country, uh, using perhaps, you know, the IGF as a mechanism, maybe. So let us know what, what's going on. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, first, let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, who is Ogero? Because maybe there are some people in the in the room that doesn't uh, know. Ogero is the public incumbent operator uh, in Lebanon, so uh, we are mainly tasked with a pure technical project like uh, connecting the nation with uh, Lebanon with fiber optics. Uh, we are currently working uh, on implementing a supercomputer for the for the students uh, for uh, to. Uh, uh, enhance uh, innovation uh, with e-science, uh, but uh, also we are trying to to align our uh, business strategies in order to accelerate uh, uh, progress in towards the SDGs. So not only we're not only working on technical issues, uh, we initiated uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, for the internet governance uh, in Lebanon, uh, I've been I've been um, involved with the UN. Uh, I've been member of the UN Mag and member of the Arab uh, Mag, and uh, we thought that the experience we gained from these uh, uh, international and regional uh, forums should be implemented uh, also in Lebanon. And luckily, the management uh, uh, at Ogero. Uh, we're uh, uh, happy to have uh, to contribute to this initiative. So we started by gathering like uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, co uh, uh, community to compose this uh, Lebanese uh, mag from the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, we tried to involve as many uh, uh, people from from uh, academia. We have uh, like more than three universities on the mag. We have. Uh, the big uh, technical communities, Cisco, Microsoft, and others. We have uh, the uh, regional organization like uh, ESQUA. We have private sector, civil society. Uh, currently, the, uh, the chair of the Lebanese uh, IGF uh, is uh, Maharat from, from the civil society. So uh, the, we, we initiated to, to prepare for, uh, for the uh, forums. We had our first forum last year, 
And uh, our second uh, yearly forum was planned, was scheduled on the on uh, uh, last week, yes. But unfortunately, due to the current situation in Lebanon, we had to postpone it uh, till uh, maybe the first quarter uh, of uh, of next year. Uh, we set uh, for ourselves uh, ourselves uh, a mission. I will share with you what what was the initial. Uh, is idea this the about the, the Lebanese yeah, IGF. For the Lebanese IGF, I mean, uh, it's to build capacity and to promote better understanding of internet governance issues by the different stakeholders in Lebanon, and to facilitate a multi-stakeholder consultation, exchange of ideas and views, to enhance the cooperation between all the different relevant uh, stakeholders. And, and to communicate with, with young people to achieve their aspiration in that area. And maybe we can be a model uh, in the region in that regard. Yeah, no, thank you, Zena. I think, you know, the Lebanese IGF is, c could, could perhaps be the best practice, you know, in the region because you actually managed to integrate, you know, the IG process. You uh, managed to learn a lot from the global level and you're trying to apply you know, all the um, learning that happened in, in due course in your local context, which is very good. And I hope, you know, other countries from the region will come to you, you know, to learn how you did it so they can actually, you yes. know, probably follow uh, steps. It's uh, the easy way, kind actually of. Actually, because of uh, the, uh, the experience we gained from the, uh, from the regional and international, we are, uh, we are now heading the Lebanese uh, IGF secretariat because mm -hmm. we, we know how we things... We know how it works, yeah. yeah. Now, well, I hope other countries will follow course, and uh, I think we still have a bit of time, and I would like to open the floor, you know, for any questions, because there is maybe... Um, a last point that we want to discuss and how to create synergies to overcome you know all the challenges that we uh, discussed today when it comes to uh, digital policy frameworks in the context of the middle east we um, touch upon um, this specific question with jane and, and sasha because you spoke a lot about how to uh, create synergies but if we have any questions from the floor on this specific point or other questions the floor is open Yes, my name is uh, Aziz Hilali. I am professor at the University of Morocco. And uh, I am also the chair of in, uh, North Africa IGF. Uh, I have just a remark about uh, uh, follow what Tijani and Hanan said about the participation of young people uh, in the IGF. Uh, Despite uh, of all efforts made by ICANN, by ISOC, by, uh, and others about fellowship program, I think, in my opinion, that our universities uh, need to introduce uh, in their curricula the, the courses on the governance internet. We tried this experience in, in my university and uh, a course with the score, and it's, uh, now it's a course in the university. And uh, to, it's, for me, it's the best way to involve these young people. And I am very happy to now to f meet some students in uh, different meetings. In, Mon in Montreal, I, I meet three students of me, and now two per per person here in uh, in Berlin, it's that's, really great, yeah. that's my hope to introduce the courses mm -hmm. of internet governance yeah. in the university. That's a very good point. I think whoever has access, you know, or influence in their university or institutions to adopt um, a curriculum specific to IG, uh, that would be good. I also heard that um, this specific topic is appealing to media students. I don't know where I heard that, but I think. Media students and media practitioners are very interested in understanding, you know, uh, the politics of the internet. So we have to kind of capitalize on that and maybe also streamline, you know, what we do. So we don't only kind of restrict our work to specific disciplines, but be more open to um, to gauge, you know, interest from other uh, people. Um, I see Khalid. Uh, 
Yeah, oh, sorry. There is, there is a question from the gentleman. Yes. Please introduce yourself and then uh, uh, your my question. My name is Mohamed El Bekri from the Data Protection Authority, CNDP. My question is addressed to Mr. Ayman. It seems that some Arab governments are still struggling uh, to shape their uh, digital policies. My question is, uh, what's missing exactly? Do, uh, are, are they self-centered or do they miss the multi-stakeholders approach or what's missing? Okay, thank you. All right, Ayman, yeah? Yes, actually what is missing is also the, the, the linkages, multi-sectoral linkages. That has been evident in many countries. The silos is not between only the organizations, but uh, uh, it is a silo between the ministers. And particularly the machinery related to planning. So the machinery related to planning does look at the socioeconomic issues and plan for it in the conventional classical approach that has been done a long time ago without the digitization. And when they mention digitalization, as my colleague and friend Qusay said, they just push it in somewhere in the national agenda. What is needed is an overarching and let us say uh, disruptive approach to uh, digital planning at the national level. So uh, the approach we are introducing this uh, starting this year and uh, onward is national digital agendas. We are working on national digital agendas that uh, by definition includes all sectors uh, and it is of course engaging the champion sector which is the ICT sector. But not anymore the, the, the silo like ICT ministry has its own agenda and the national planning has just a, a stamp or that we use the word digital and AI somewhere here and there. So what does in, this entail? It entails a process. What the process would be a multi-sectoral interdisciplinary process that also multi-stakeholder in nature across all sectors. But for this to happen, we have to start with the also multi-sectoral reviews. And this is what we introduced. This is really very tedious and very heavy, but this the, uh, response to the question of the gap, response to the question of the stock taking of problems and challenges at the national level, and it's a feed uh, forward to the think tanks. I mean, we as in the UN as think tank, we cannot really give, I mean, uh, uh, one uh, size fits all uh, policy advice. So this is really the starting point for correct advice and advocacy. So without that thing, and this is what happened in the 2030 community. They started by the national VNRs, Voluntary National Reviews. And this Voluntary National Reviews is the starting point for the 2030 planning. So we are doing the same, Voluntary National Reviews for the digital development. And from there, we hope in two years' time, we will have this national things uh, uh, at the country level. The rest is details. I mean, who, who, who to implement, uh, where are the partners, who trains, but the vision should start from that holistic uh, standpoint. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, that was very useful, and uh, we have a question from uh, Khalid. Yeah. Thank you, Hanan, and uh, very quickly, my name is Khalid Ibrahim from the Gulf Center for Human Rights, and uh, I want, uh, f first of all, to agree with you uh, when you started this session uh, about the lack of interest among our governments when it's about digital security, but then we have other problems that we need to address. Like, I just give you a quickly an example. In March, we brought, uh, before March, uh, at the start of this year, we brought some young activists who are uh, really IT experts, and they have interest in promoting a free and open internet, and they managed to write a proposal for uh, the IGF. It's about uh, the dual technology that used by our government to monitor online activism. It was really well-established proposal, and unfortunately, it was rejected, and I believe there was no any justification for such a rejection. Now, we just need to work together. And I agree with Nadira about really civil society should be involved all the time. Whenever you have a project, an initiative, consider them. There are a lot of them working in the field. And we are here, just as I said earlier, that we, we are here to work with you to have a prosperous future. We are not uh, different from any other nation that uh, needs to be civilized and to have respect for civil society. So I am trying to uh, organize with some colleagues a, a meeting for MENA in which all the stakeholders could work together. Mm -hmm. That's our purpose here. We want to work 
together, we want to promote a free internet, we want to respect the human and civil rights of our citizens. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Harit. Thank you, Harit. Uh, very, uh, very good uh, point, and it's pertinent. I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, room uh, for improvement when it comes to engaging civil society. Um, so, yeah, so point taken, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, maybe we don't have any more questions and uh, I would like, you know, to give the panel uh, maybe uh, the opportunity to uh, add some concluding remarks, if any. If not, I think um, the session is uh, over and um, I'll pass on the microphone to Hisham. Uh, everybody may stay in their seats so we can conclude the session. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Hanan, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, from the speakers, from the co-organizers, and the uh, speakers of the first panel as well. Uh, I know how challenging it is to stay until 6 p.m. on day zero, only on day zero, so uh, uh, thank you all for sticking down. Uh, just to, to highlight some of the takeaways of uh, the discussion, and I will keep it very brief so that we can still enjoy the evening. Uh, I, I think the word uh, uh, context is king, reflects many of what we have uh, uh, discussed and learned from our speakers uh, during the session. Um, uh, several speakers actually talked about the importance of uh, how we package uh, internet governance to keep it interesting, as Tijani, uh, you mentioned, and uh, uh, e-package it uh, in a way that matches uh, the context. Um, there was obvious also that our countries, maybe uh, not just the government, but other stakeholders as well, are uh, taking different approaches to internet and internet governance, as uh, Yushafi also highlighted. Uh, and this is maybe uh, one reason and also a result of how we engaged uh, at different fora like IGF, like uh, ITU, like ICANN, and so on. Um, so it's, uh, it's obvious that the need to uh, institutionalize uh, at various levels, uh, whether at uh, uh, regional or national, is uh, key to what uh, could be done. Um, uh, there's a lot to be done at the national level, uh, whether from the planning uh, for our digital strategies or uh, for how we can uh, also engage with uh, different stakeholders, whether civil society, as Khaled mentioned, or uh, technical community uh, or other uh, private sector actors. Uh, process is important. Uh, Ayman, you highlighted this. Um, so having the process uh, right is, is very important to our stakeholders to, to properly engage. Uh, and of course, the last thing is the long term. So digital policies, internet governance is not something that just works overnight. You need to invest on the long term other than uh, just expect quick results. So the impact is usually the long term. So uh, by that, we conclude the session. Uh, thank you all again for participating and being part of this. Thank you uh, all our speakers and our partners for uh, responding to, uh, to our invitation to this one. And uh, till next time maybe. Thank you. Thank you.